Chapter One of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Alps, the Danube, and the Near East by Frank G. Carpenter. Introducing ourselves. This is to make us acquainted. Although you are seated in your favorite armchair in your library, while i am in europe some thousands of miles away yet we are traveling companions as i sit here in my hotel on the shore of lake geneva the snowy alps look down upon me and mont blanc is in plain view over the water the palace of the league of nations is but a stone's throw away and france is within easy reach i have come here direct from new york to be the personal conductor of our tour together we are going from geneva to the golden horn from the oldest Christian Republic of Europe to the new democracy of Mohammedan Turkey, drifting leisurely about this way and that through the many countries between. We have no detailed itinerary, but, like Napoleon, shall cross the Alps into Italy, and like Socrates, chat as we stroll about the slopes of Mount Parnassus in Greece. We shall linger under the shadows of the Tatra and Bohemian Mountains in Czechoslovakia talk with the king of bulgaria on the heights of sophia and take a lunch with queen marie in her summer palace in the carpathians much of our time will be spent on or near the danube and in the rich bread lands of hungary and serbia lining its banks we shall take a run from yugoslavia down into greece and see the modern nation building up a new civilization traveling in the footsteps of the romans in ancient dacia we shall make a trip through the oil fields of Romania, cross the delta of the Danube to the Black Sea, and sailing the Bosporus between Asia and Europe, end our trip in Turkey at the Golden Horn. Our travels will thus embrace ten different countries, all more or less hoary with antiquity, but all alive and young with the regeneration that followed the World War. We shall hear the cry of the new Italy in what was the very heart of Imperial Rome, see the republics of austria and czechoslovakia rising out of the ruins of the Habsburgs, and find in hungary a constitutional monarchy controlled by the magyars we shall meet the newest of modern political movements in bulgaria and Romania, and in turkey the land of the saracens shall behold the followers of the prophet studying the maxims of our christian colonial forefathers as they tried to build up a republic in the home of the sultans our travels include a large territory and the countries and the peoples are so varied in character that at every step of the trip we shall have some new thing to see end of chapter one chapter two of the alps the danube and the near east by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by betty b at the world's peace capital from the slough of despond to the delectable mountains from isms and ologies to plain common sense from nations still prostrated by the mightiest conflict in all history to the people of perpetual peace that is how one feels when one enters switzerland from any of the war exhausted countries of europe i have called the swiss the people of peace but theirs has been peace after strife. Still, their fights have been only to gain or preserve their freedom and not to acquire more territory by robbing their neighbors. For centuries, this little mountainous country, surrounded, as it were, by the bullies of Europe, has guarded its boundaries and kept its independence. The city of Geneva is emblematic of peace, and its sturdy stand for liberty has made it the fitting seat of the League of Nations strolling about the city today i stumbled upon two monuments that seem to me to symbolize the role geneva now plays one is a great wall of sculpture made of white sandstone three hundred feet long and perhaps fifty feet high built against the old wall of geneva with the waters of the medieval moat still washing its base it is the reformation monument and commemorates the battle this city waged for religious freedom now more than three hundred years ago in the center cut out of the sandstone are statues of john calvin and john knox 
together with those of Farrell and Beza, who also lived and worked here. The figures are more than three times life-size and are beyond description majestic. Besides the central group, there are six smaller statues, representing the most independent thinkers of the great nations of that time. One is of Admiral Coligny, the hero of the Huguenots, another of Oliver Cromwell, who freed England from the Stuarts, a third of the great Dutchman, William of Orange, and a fourth, under the wide hat of Puritan days, is of our own Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island. The other monument stands for the peaceful settlement of international disputes. It is the Alabama Room inside the Cantonal Capitol and City Hall of Geneva. Here, a great financial controversy between countries was first settled by arbitration. This was the celebrated case of the Alabama claims, and in this chamber it was decreed that England should pay over to the United States fifteen and a half million dollars in compensation for the outrages committed by British privateers during our Civil War. In the same room was held the initial meeting of the International Red Cross. A citizen of Geneva, Henri Dunant, was responsible for the founding of the organization. As an eyewitness of the desperate battle of Solferino, he observed the vast amount of suffering resulting from the inability of the Army Surgical Corps to care for the thousands of wounded that lay about the field. He suggested the formation of societies in every country for training nurses and collecting supplies to be used in time of war. The outcome was the International Red Cross Society, which first met in Geneva in 1864. The Swiss red and white flag, with colors reversed, was adopted as the badge that has since come to mean so much throughout the world to sufferers from war, famine, pestilence, and other disasters. Among the relics in this room is a brass model of the Liberty Bell at Philadelphia. It is as big as a quart cup and was sent to Geneva from the Paris Exposition. Almost 50 years later, it rang to order the opening assembly of the League of Nations. Here also are a plow and a pruning hook made of the swords of Union and Confederate officers of our Civil War. Some of its citizens and the friends of the League of Nations call Geneva the peace capital of the world. The city is well situated as a home for the idea of international peace. Lying as it does in the heart of Europe and near the great ports, it is easily accessible to all parts of the earth. On a winding lake of cerulean blue, under the icy eyes of Mont Blanc, and in a climate unsurpassed for comfort and health, there is no other capital with such delightful surroundings. At its widest, the Lake of Geneva is only eight miles across, but it is longer than from Baltimore to Washington, and in many places so deep that two Washington monuments, one on top of the other, could rest upon its bottom, and the tip of the second would just reach the surface. The lake is in the form of a gooseneck squash, with Geneva at the tip of the bill. Its waters are light sapphire, and so clear that in sailing over it one can see the fish swimming above the silver stones far below. It is covered with craft, large and small, from motor launches and steamboats to the skiffs and canoes plying from town to town and village to village along its shores. Geneva is at the southern end, or mouth, of the lake, where the Rhone pours out on its way to the Mediterranean Sea. The river divides the city into several islands on which are bathhouses, restaurants, cafes, a waterworks, and a power plant. One of the bridges over the Rhone is on the site of a bridge destroyed by Julius Caesar, 78 years before Christ, when he had here his first battle with the Helvetians, the forebears of the Swiss of today. The whole lake is lined with summer homes set in the midst of beautiful lawns and luxuriant shrubbery. There is a wide quay running back of the waterfront where the people promenade of an evening. This has long rows of trees much like sycamores whose silvery trunks reach a height of 15 feet and then sprout out into gigantic umbrellas of green. Behind this quay with its trees is the Palace of the League of Nations, the chief administrative building of this world peace capital. 
It stands on land that once belonged to the brave Helvetians, and is perhaps but a stone's throw from where they fought so stubbornly with Caesar's Roman legions. It looks out on the lake, across which Mont Blanc is in plain view in the distance. I have called the building a palace. This is the name given it by the League and the people of Geneva, though it is, in fact, merely a summer hotel turned into an office building. It is a four-story structure which you could drop into one of the big hostelries of Atlantic City and hardly know it was there. And as for its beauty, many hotels of that seaside resort surpass it. There are perhaps 200 rooms. It is built of stone covered with stucco and painted light brown. There are fine grounds and trees between it and the promenade, and at one end is a sun parlor in which I am told the Council of the League often meets. Entering the palace, I was glad to find at the door neither court flunkies in livery nor soldiers with swords and guns. Admission is free to all men and women of every nation, and a messenger behind a desk at the entrance who speaks English, German, French, and Italian tells visitors where to go and what to see. When I asked for one of the officials of the information section, he directed me to take the lift to the fourth floor, walk to room five, and show myself in. I took the push-button elevator and rose slowly upward. As I stepped out, I saw a sign over the button notifying me that all persons are expected to walk downstairs, although they may ride all the way up. This may not seem like business efficiency, yet it can be commended on the ground of economy. I explored the building in company with a former American newspaper man now associated with the League. I went from room to room, meeting some of the higher officials, sitting in on some of the conferences, and trying to get as best I could a conception of just what the League is and what it is trying to do toward bringing about better relations between the many powers and peoples of the earth. As a result of my investigations, I am convinced that the idea of the League as it now exists is different from that in which it was conceived, or even that in which it had birth amid the terrific labor pains of the Treaty of Versailles. The babe was lusty, and many thought of the League as destined to be the strong man with a big stick. Today it is as quiet and as peaceful as the dove Noah sent forth from the ark, and it now expects to do by conference what it once thought to do by force. It is founded largely on the faith described in Hebrews as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But I would say further that this faith promises to be of the kind that moves mountains and that the League is on its way to great accomplishment. In brief, the League of Nations is an association of states pledged to a new way of conducting foreign affairs. These states have signed a contract or covenant the constitution of the league to do certain things they have agreed not to go to war with each other or with any non-member nation until they have brought their disputes to arbitration before the league and have waited from three to nine months after the questions have been submitted the peoples in disagreement are supposed to follow the advice and abide by the decisions of the league and if they begin hostilities without submitting their controversies the other states are bound to sever all economic and political relations with the offending countries. As I understand it, there have been many mental reservations and some modifications of this first provision of the League, and for the time, at least, its teeth have been drawn. The second provision binds the nations to work together for certain objects of the common welfare. These include such non-political matters as promotion of the public health the control of the traffic in opium and other dangerous drugs, and the suppression of the traffic in women and children. They relate also to certain financial and economic adjustments and to matters of international communications. To carry out these objects, the League of Nations has been organized into an assembly and council. The assembly is composed of delegates of all the member states. Each delegation has only one vote and the majority rules. The council might be called the executive committee of the League. It is composed of one government delegate from each of the four great powers, France, Great Britain, Italy, and Japan, and one delegate from each of six smaller powers. The latter are elected by the majority vote of the assembly. 
the assembly meets at geneva once a year in september the ten delegates of the council meet every two months under these two chief parts of the league are subordinate branches the secretariat general is devoted to carrying out the decrees of the council and the assembly it gathers data for them outlines future work as directed and suggests methods of procedure it is the great source of information about every subject with which the league has to deal and it may be called upon by any of the members at will this body is headed by a secretary general who has under him about three hundred and fifty experts clerks and officials of one kind or another furthermore when occasion demands he can call in experts from any part of the world in addition to this body there is the international court of justice which sits at the hague and is composed of eleven judges and four deputy judges elected by the assembly and the council another adjunct of the league created by the treaty of versailles is the international labor office it has its headquarters here separate and apart from the secretariat general which alone occupies the so-called world palace of peace this is a bare outline of the constitution of the league what it has accomplished and what it is doing would fill many pages during my stay i have had talks with experts and officials from a dozen of the leading countries of the world including japan i am impressed with the earnestness and confidence of them all and with their plain common sense view of world troubles the active workers in the secretariat including representatives of more than thirty nations and perhaps an equal or greater number in the labor organization all these men are authorities on matter relating to their own lands and there is scarcely any subject of international interest that cannot be pretty thoroughly threshed out among them the meetings of the council and the assembly are largely conferences where the delegates come together to discuss not only their differences but all matters of common interest to the nations of the world i understand that the greatest courtesy prevails at these meetings and that they are really bringing the governments and the peoples of the earth closer together the work of the league is being done at a very small cost i see no signs of extravagance anywhere and on every hand are evidences of great industry and practical administration so far the annual expenses have been only about five million dollars a small sum for running the whole universe when you recall that operating the united states government alone costs more than three billions a year this five million dollar expense is prorated among the several nations belonging to the league according to their hypothetical capacity to pay with some i may say in passing the payment is theoretical only and now a few words about what the league has done i have before me an official report consisting of seventy two pages of legal cap typewritten manuscript the whole weighs one pound and nine ounces and it contains i estimate at least twenty five thousand words my report must be confined to a few lines in the first place the league has really begun to exert an influence in matters of war and peace it settled without warfare the dispute between finland and sweden regarding the aland islands which it awarded to the finns with the consent of the swedes it adjusted the albanian serbian boundary controversy even after the yugoslavs had actually come in by night and destroyed three hundred albanian villages it fixed the frontiers of lithuania and poland and although the lithuanians do not feel entirely satisfied they are abiding by the league's decision in addition to arbitrating these larger questions the league has settled minor international contentions which might have caused wars among the latter was the friction between hungary and roumania which at one time bade fair to burst out into fighting as an example of the creative work of the league we have the restoration and recreation of austria this is one of the wonders of international finance everyone knows how austria practically dismembered by the peace treaty had reached the uttermost economic despair it had been advanced in one way or another the sum of one hundred and twenty five million dollars and still its condition grew worse and worse it was about to give up and go into bankruptcy when the league came in and was given a free hand to find a solution it brought order out of chaos 
and by an expenditure of only thirty thousand dollars lifted up the nation set it on its feet and started it on the road to recovery in addition to these things the league is doing much in international welfare work more than all it is enabling the nations to see that while each differs from the others in important characteristics and special interests none has hoofs or horns another institution at geneva that is helping the nations to get better acquainted is the summer school at the university founded by john calvin here the young men and women of america france great britain and of every country can meet and receive special instruction from international experts along any lines they may choose some of the great scholars of our time live on the shores of lake geneva and this and other schools attract students from all parts of the world thus through the mingling of the pick of their youth the countries are being drawn into closer and closer harmony and more and more people are coming around to the idea that maybe lord robert cecil was right when during his trip to our country he said the belief held by many that all the naughty people live on one side of the atlantic and all the goody goodies live on the other is perhaps to say the least open to discussion end of chapter two chapter three of the alps the danube and the near east this librivox recording is in the public domain read by betty b europe's oldest republic in the capital of switzerland halfway between the borders of germany and italy and only two hours by rail from where the league of nations is sitting at geneva i write of how the swiss govern themselves during my stay in bern i have visited parliament and talked with the members i have seen something of the bundesrat the council or cabinet that administers the country and have set across a plain table from the president of the republic and discussed with him the differences between his government and ours we pride ourselves on being the great republic of the world the swiss had established the independence of some of their cantons more than five hundred years before our republic was started it was two hundred years before columbus was born that william tell shot the apple off the head of his boy some of the authorities say that that story is not true but then many of them doubt even the bible at any rate in twelve ninety one the men of three forest districts formed an everlasting league for defense which was the foundation of the swiss confederation and along in the thirteen hundreds a thousand or so swiss leaguers defeated an austrian army of ten times their number and established a republican government it was after that battle that the name switzerland was applied to this mountain land but just what is switzerland and who are the swiss fancy yourself in an airplane that has just risen to the summit of mont blanc start there on the border of france and fly eastward to the new boundary of austria you have not traveled as far as from new york to boston yet you have crossed the country now fly to the northwest to basel on the borders of germany and then directly south to the borders of italy if you speed the machine you can make that trip in an hour and twelve minutes looking down from the airplane one is reminded of what a sailor of the days of columbus said to the king of spain in describing the island of santo domingo he took up a sheet of notepaper squeezed it in his fist and threw it misshapen and wrinkled upon the table saying your majesty santo domingo is like that this would be a good description of switzerland as seen from the air the land is all hills and hollows with snow-capped peaks gorges and canyons and here and there a plateau or a wide valley nevertheless the swiss have made the alps bloom like a garden a considerable portion of the country is still covered with forests as carefully looked after as the trees on your lawn another large part is pasture from which the stones have been picked so that the sweet grass grows among the big rocks while in the foothills and valleys are thousands of small farms and vineyards about one-third of the land is in cultivation the alps are here in two ranges with a stretch of tableland running between the juras and the higher alps from geneva to lake constance this strip 
which comprises about one-fifth of the country, has a bed of rich soil and is intensely cultivated. It is the backbone of Swiss agriculture and includes the chief industrial and financial region. Here are most of the cities and hundreds of villages. Switzerland is a country of villages and has but few large centers. The four leading municipalities are Zurich and Basel at the north, Bern in the center, and Geneva at the west. But these four towns together have not half as many people as has Detroit, and only two-thirds the population of Boston. The whole country is not quite twice the size of Massachusetts, and its total population numbers about the same as Chicago's. And now what of the inhabitants of this wonderful country? Like the Americans, they are a mixed people, and that makes for strength. Switzerland's neighbors are Germans on the north and east, Italians on the south, and French on the west. The Swiss are a blending of these three stocks. In Geneva, on the edge of France, the common language is French. On the north and east, it is German, and over the divide, the popular tongue is that of Italy. Almost everyone can speak French and German, and many know Italian as well. One sees French and German signs over the stores, and there are newspapers in all three languages. The Swiss are well educated. Everybody here can read and does read. There are schools everywhere, and the nation is known for its educational facilities. People come from all over the world to attend Swiss universities and to have their children taught German and French in the schools. Today, there is absolute equality among the people who are the most democratic and independent in Europe. They have carried republicanism farther than we have and have ironed out many of the troubles with which we are still struggling. As far as I can learn, there is neither graft nor pork barrel in the conduct of the government and the Swiss parliament is much more respected than our Congress. The whole nation takes an interest in public affairs and everyone goes to the polls. The parliament is made up of men from all classes though most of the members are of moderate means and simple life. Bern is one of the oldest, quaintest, and most charming little cities of Europe. Founded when Richard the Lionhearted of England was fighting the Turks for the possession of Jerusalem, it was a free city before the Magna Carta was signed. It was chosen as the seat of the Swiss Confederation at about the time of our Mexican War, and since then has been the home of all government activities except those of the Supreme Court, which, as a sop to French Switzerland, sits at Lausanne. Bern is only about one-fifth the size of Washington, but is far more picturesque. The town is divided by the deep, swift, rushing air, whose glacial waters roar as they tear their way on down toward the Rhine. Magnificent bridges span the stream. The capital and the President's Palace are on a height right over the river. They look toward the Alps, facing a half dozen mountains more than two miles in height. After my talk with the President, we walked out on the balcony in front of his office, and His Excellency pointed out the gigantic crest of the Jungfrau and other snow-capped peaks that are known all over the world. Before entering the government buildings, I strolled about through the business parts of the city. I felt as if I had slipped back into the Middle Ages. The narrow streets are walled with three- and four-story buildings with overhanging tiled roofs, out of which peep little dormer windows, looking down like so many red-rimmed eyes on the traffic below. Some of the houses are so old that they lean this way and that and make one think of the drunken structures on the Amsterdam piles. Here and there the arch of a tower curves over the highway. In the most noted of the towers is a great clock, dating from the 16th century. When the hours strike, a little door in the tower flies open, and in the doorway a great rooster struts and crows, while a troop of bears marches in procession around a figure supposed to represent time. This clock has hands and figures plated with gold, and its dial, which is about 20 feet in diameter, is decorated with frescoes. I walked through the arch of the tower and under the clock into a mile or so of arcaded stores. The pavements seem to be tunneled through the walls of the houses and are lined with stores. The stores are like monastery cells looking out upon cloisters. 
it is so dark in them that most of the shops have to burn electric lights throughout the whole day the arcades are about fifteen feet wide and in the oldest part of the town so low that one's head is not far from the ceiling now and then there are cross tunnels for the streets cutting through to the right and the left the whole forming a kind of catacomb quaint and delightful but not in accord with our ideas of business efficiency the chief government buildings are situated between these arcaded streets and the air on the high bluff over the river from the opposite bank of the stream they look like fortifications they were planned by swiss architects and built of sandstone from the quarries of Bern and marble from several cantons the wood is all native and the furnishings even to the great clock in the entrance hall were made in switzerland the clock which is the official timepiece of the republic is as big as a piano box and has a glass case that shows the works the swiss keep everything polished up to the nines and the assembly halls are scrubbed like so many dutch kitchens as i pass through on my way to see the president i noticed a gang of old women on their knees washing the tiles there were foot scrapers and foot wipers at the entrance and rugs for cleaning one's shoes at every door during my whole trip i saw no cuspidors such as one sees in every corner about the halls of our congress this afternoon i visited the assembly rooms and lingered a while in the lobbies which are walled with marble and have ceilings gorgeous with paintings and carvings the chamber of the national council is built in the shape of a half moon with the seats rising in concentric rows from the front to the back the president sits on a raised platform somewhat like our speaker's dais with a clerk on each side of him and the press gallery is at the front so that the members face the newspaper men as they speak a curious feature is the public translator speeches may be made in any one of three languages german french or italian the orders of the president are translated by the official interpreter and all his messages are furnished to the press in german and french the government reports are printed in german french and italian so that every citizen can read them the swiss republic is as free and democratic as ours but the machinery of administration is different the country is divided into twenty-two cantons or states which elect a national council and a state council the state council corresponds to our senate being composed of forty-four members two from each canton the national council is like our house of representatives it has one hundred and eighty-nine members chosen by direct vote at the rate of one for every twenty thousand of population in the confederation the two houses together are called the federal assembly clergymen are not eligible for election to either house general elections are held every three years on the last sunday in october and the voting is often done in the churches only men over twenty one have the right to vote for switzerland has not yet adopted suffrage for women each canton elects and pays two members of the state council in any way it may choose the geneva councillors get five dollars a day but the average salary of the others is four dollars some members get only three dollars the representatives of the lower houses are paid from the government treasury and get five dollars a day for the days they are present the legislative sessions are held four times a year as they usually last only two or three weeks a whole year's service seldom takes up as much as three months the members attend regularly their constituents object if they stay away if a representative in the national council cannot give a good reason for his absence he does not get his five dollars the meetings begin at eight in the morning in summer and at nine in the winter the executive authority of the swiss government is in the hands of the bundesrat or federal council whose seven members are elected by the federal assembly every three years these seven men have the fattest official jobs in the republic if five thousand dollars a year can be called fat they are like our cabinet members and each one is allotted a department the federal council elects the president of the republic who has a far different position from that of the president of the united states his term is for one year and his salary is fifty four hundred dollars 
he is really only the chairman of the council the vice president is also elected by the bundesrat and it is an unwritten law that he shall succeed the president neither president nor vice president may hold his office for two successive years the president with whom i talk today is karl schurr a citizen of bern he is a well-educated stout little man with a fair complexion and a scanty thatch of blond hair fringing the shiny baldness of his crown he was dressed in a business suit with a high wing collar and a black tie and wore large glasses with black rims behind which his blue eyes twinkled as he talked the room where we chatted was plainly furnished in a cabinet against one wall were models of rifles and cartridges used by switzerland to guard her neutrality during the world war and opposite this looking down upon the president's desk was an old photograph of abraham lincoln in the secretary's room adjoining i saw two portraits one of robert e lee and the other of william t sherman both painted in eighteen sixty nine by a swiss artist my conversation with the president covered a wide range we talked of the political parties of which the country has a half dozen or more including social democrats liberal democrats catholics agrarians and others when we touched on the tariff the president said that our high duties do much to hold down the production of swiss factories we spoke of the initiative and the referendum both of which he approves though not without some grains of salt the government of switzerland owns the railways and the telegraph and the telephones are under the post office department as usual in such cases the properties are extravagantly managed and last year the posts and the railways ran almost two million dollars behind republicanism goes farther here than with us every village and district is a little republic the communes into which the cantons or states are divided correspond somewhat to our counties townships and wards they are more than three thousand in number and settle almost every local question the people elect their own school teachers and policemen and have town meetings in which they decide upon all communal matters sometimes the meetings are held in the open air and the decisions are by acclamation some communes own property such as forest lands and houses and in these every family may be entitled to free pasture or free wood for the winter in the early morning and again at twilight one sometimes hears the concert of the cowbells as the cows owned by the various families of a village are being driven to or from the communal pastures in the mountains nearby. Once back in the village, every cow straightway seeks her own home without any urging. A few of the communes have grown rich from their forest, rents, lands, and houses. The privilege of citizenship in such communes is somewhat like membership in a prosperous stock company and if it is not inherited, it may be bought for a good round sum. On the other hand, it may prove less than a blessing, for each commune must pay its local expenses and take care of its own poor. End of chapter 3《The Beehives of the Alps》Pluck a hair from the head of your baby, stand it on end under a microscope, and split it lengthwise into five hundred strips. Now measure the thickness of each strip, and if your work has been absolutely accurate, you may have an idea of the exactness of the tools used in a Geneva watch factory. It was almost under the shadow of the Palace of the League of Nations that I went through a factory that has been making watches for 150 years. I found the workmen using micrometers that measure a hair as you might measure a log with a pair of calipers. In order to prove this fact, I pulled out one of the sandy gray hairs still left on my head and handed it to a watchmaker. He found it was five hundredths of a millimeter thick and flattered me by saying, it is as fine as the hair of a woman. Some of the screws made for the watches are smaller than the head of a pin, and there are cog wheels with teeth as tiny 
as the finest grain of sand on the seashore indeed i had to use a microscope to see the teeth at all every watch has one hundred and seventy parts and the chief difference between large and small timepieces is in the size of their mechanisms this factory makes some watches not as big as your thumbnail no watch keeps perfect time but some made here vary only a second in twenty-four hours or just about six minutes a year if you will open the back of your watch and look at the flying balance wheel you may have some idea of what this means that balance wheel is making about eighteen thousand revolutions an hour and it travels thousands of miles every year if i remember correctly it goes eighteen miles every day nevertheless in a distance as far as from new york to detroit its variation is only five feet switzerland has been making watches for three or four hundred years for generations all the watches were manufactured in the homes of the workers only one or two parts being made at each house later factories were established and after the cheap machine-made american watch began to capture the trade the swiss adopted similar methods and turned out watches by the thousands where they had formerly made them by the dozens the united states has always been one of the chief buyers of swiss watches but we import mostly finished movements making the cases ourselves switzerland makes fine clocks as well as fine watches the stores sell clocks so small that you can carry one in your vest pocket and there are others so large that they are fit only for church steeples neither the watches nor the clocks are cheap yet i doubt whether the average timepiece of this country is any better than or even as good as our own in zurich in eastern switzerland where i am now the people devote their skill to textiles instead of to metalworking this is the weaving and embroidery center just as western switzerland is the watchmaking region the town of zurich does a big business in silk basel at the head of the navigation of the rhine on the border of germany is the chief place for the manufacture of ribbons not far from lucerne a great deal of artificial silk is made and st gall sends us hundreds of thousands of yards of embroideries there are cantons such as appenzell where the people have been producing handmade lace for centuries i spent some time last week at lake brienz on the borders of which is a village of wood carvers who make toys and other articles that are sold all over the continent in some families all the men have been wood carvers for hundreds of years on the south side of the alps the italian swiss are breeding silkworms and one district raises snails for the gourmets of paris the villages often specialize in single trades one town sending out masons or glaziers and another graduating pastry cooks most of the waiters and many of the best chefs and managers in the hotels of europe were trained in switzerland the tourist and hotel business is an important factor in the life of the nation the thousands of hotels represent an investment of about five hundred million dollars they spend on provisions and wages something like twenty million dollars a year and earn big profits in good seasons formerly the best patrons were the germans who came three or four times a year and spent freely now most of the money comes from americans i am surprised to find how important agriculture is in this land of the mountains one would think nothing could be raised in a country all hills and hollows but the truth is that three-fourths of the total area of switzerland is productive there are several hundred thousand farms and it is estimated that there are a quarter of a million acres in holdings of less than fifteen acres each every patch not covered with rocks or snow is either cultivated or used for pasture or forest about thirty per cent of the land is wooded and almost forty per cent is given up to grass high up in the mountains you will find cows feeding on patches of green no bigger than parlor rugs and separated from each other by piles of stone the cows are turned out in the mountains as soon as the grass sprouts in the spring and are driven higher and higher up as summer comes on the people watch every grass patch and manure each one every year when the automobiles began coming over the mountains they feared that the dust raised would hurt the grass and i am told that they often threw buckets of filth at passing cars to show their displeasure 
nearly every farmer knows how to make cheese of which fifteen million dollars worth is annually exported the two thousand or more factories engaged in cheese making use something like one hundred and fifty million gallons of milk in a year the cream is excellent but as a rule one gets only hot milk for his coffee at the hotels the swiss also make a great deal of condensed milk and milk chocolate from an industrial standpoint switzerland labors at great disadvantage through her lack of raw materials and coal she has no minerals of value and she has to import all the fuel she uses to make steam or electricity the charges for coal are so high as to be almost prohibitive and wood is practically the only fuel an american woman who lives in zurich tells me she had to pay seventy five dollars a ton last winter for coal to make up for her lack of coal switzerland has begun to develop her water powers and in time the white coal of the mountains will make her practically independent of the black diamonds bought at such exorbitant prices from france or great britain the great hope of the country lies in the waterfalls of the alps their force has been measured and it is estimated that the power available is equivalent to about four million tons of coal every year enough to run all the swiss factories and railways and light every home in this mountain land within a few years all the trains in the country will be electrically driven they are already drawn through the st Gotthard and simplon tunnels by electric locomotives and the lines from goldau to zug from Immelsi to rothkris and from lucerne to zurich have also been electrified the total railroad mileage now operated by electric power is as great as the distance from detroit to new orleans and in her total per capita water power development switzerland is second only to norway while switzerland has a per capita foreign trade much larger than ours the value of the goods she sells to the world comes chiefly from the skill with which she manufactures them and she has to buy all her raw materials from abroad in the hands of the swiss a pound of cotton becomes a pound of lace worth five hundred times what was paid for the material in it and a few bits of metal are transformed by the workmen into a delicate watch of great value the swiss are among the world's experts in making the most of what they have and they are one of the thriftiest peoples on earth this little republic leads all nations in the number of its savings accounts in a population of less than four millions there are two million six hundred thousand savings bank depositors and the total sum to their credit is almost five hundred million dollars the canton of geneva ranks first in number of depositors and amount of savings and the genovese cares so much for the pennies that a savings account may be opened with as little as four cents i am told that deposits of less than one franc are often made by the grown-ups and that the children paste uncancelled postage stamps in books and send them to be credited this saving sense among the genovese is proverbial i think it was voltaire that wrote of a woman who fell into lake geneva and was drowned she was taken out apparently lifeless the rescuers moved her arms back and forth but her heart did not beat a mirror was placed on her lips and no sign of vapor appeared her pulse did not throb and her flesh was stone cold they were about to put her into a coffin when voltaire who stood by asked about her nationality he was told she was a genovese ah said he wait a moment i am sure i can bring her to life and thereupon he took a five franc piece out of his pocket and laid it in her open palm the fingers came together with a jerk and the silver was clutched tightly in her fist the woman straight away sat up and put the coin into her pocket i cannot vouch for the truth of this story but i should hate to risk a dollar that way today switzerland is the land of the apron and the patched pantaloon neither man nor woman is ashamed of work or working clothes every laborer has on his blue jeans and every woman clerk wears a nightgown like slip of white cotton covering her dress from shoulders to shoe tops the railway porters and the baggage men the street cleaners the grocers the butchers the bakers and the candlestick makers all wear something to protect their clothes while at their trades the mechanics wear aprons and every schoolboy and schoolgirl has a loose black overdress 
which buttons tight round the throat and catches the ink spots. In Switzerland, there is no display for the sake of display, and the people are democratic both in manner and dress. Geneva, for example, is a city of the rich, and there are hundreds of families who live on incomes from their investments. They have beautiful villas, and their homes are wonders of comfort and beauty, but everyone seems to dress simply. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. From the top of the Jungfrau. I first saw the Alps when, as a boy, I walked from Italy over the Simplon and climbed on foot to Chamonix and the famed Mer de Glace. Today, one shoots under the Simplon in a tunnel and reaches Mont Blanc by a railroad. An electric road has pierced the heart of St. Gothard, and it was by bottled lightning that I came to the Jungfrau Jock in the glacier-covered saddle between the Jungfrau and its mighty neighbor, the Monk. Years ago, I stopped at the monastery from which the St. Bernard dogs were sent out with brandy kegs strapped to their necks to rescue mountain climbers lost in the snow. Now, at the dangerous spots, there are telephones so that one may call up Central and find out where he is. The Alps are latticed with electric ladders, and the gods' great gifts of magnificent scenery have been brought within easy reach of man. As I write these words, I am more than two miles above the level of the sea, with clouds above and below me, and giant peaks of ice all around. Right under my feet is the Alesh Glacier, a dazzling mass of ice and snow a thousand feet deep and more than twenty miles long. Beyond, through a break in the mist, I can look into a canyon, where far down in the green lies the toy town of Interlaken, from which I have come. To right and left there are huge masses of snow-dusted rocks. Towering above me, the peak of the Jungfrau is lost in the clouds. The Jungfrau Jacques is about a half mile from the summit, and the gigantic Monk, whose height is only two hundred feet less, is at my back, like a snow-gloved hand reaching up to the blue. The clouds, the rocks, and the snow make the whole seem a mighty valley of desolation, which just now is curtained with masses of vapor rolling to the sky and shutting in for the time being this cold, awful, stupendous workshop of the gods. In a few moments the clouds will break, and I shall have a glimpse of the Alps tumbling over one another away off to the east and the west. I have seen most of the great mountain views of the world, but none which for sheer beauty surpasses that of the Jungfrau. I have stood on Tiger Hill near Jarjeeling and watched the sun gild the top of Mount Everest, the loftiest mountain on earth. Everest is almost three miles higher than the Jungfrau, but the effect from Tiger Hill is somewhat spoiled by distance and by the lower peak of Kunchenjinga, which stands in the foreground obstructing the view. From the bronze statue of Christ that marks the boundary between Argentina and Chile, I have seen Aconcagua, the highest of the Andes. It is almost two miles higher than where I am now, but like Mount Everest, it is dwarfed by its surroundings. I have seen Mount McKinley from the heights of Alaska, and I know Fujiyama, the snowy, symmetrical cone that the Japanese worship. Each has its own beauties, but none has a more beautiful setting than the Jungfrau, the Virgin of the Alps. Whether viewed from the valley or here face to face, she has a majesty all her own. My trip up the Jungfrau was made on the Cog Railway. When Mark Twain was at Interlaken in 1892, he predicted that one day would come when every mountain in Switzerland would have a railroad up its back like a pair of suspenders. That prophecy is almost fulfilled. There are something like a hundred Cog roads in the Alps, and when the times are good in Europe, they must pay very large dividends. The Jungfrau Railway is remarkable in that a greater part of it is a tunnel through the rock under glaciers and snow. After running for some miles on the face of the mountains, it cuts into the heart of the Jungfrau and the Monk and crawls upward through a great wormhole excavated in the limestone and gneiss. The trains are pulled by 300 horsepower locomotives run by electricity generated by waterfalls. The rack and pinion system used is a new one, 
which is said to be absolutely safe. My ride from Interlaken to Jungfrau Jok was delightful. The three cars were walled with windows and had comfortable seats. They were filled with tourists talking German, French, and English. Most of them were provided with guidebooks and maps, and many were busy looking for things mentioned by others instead of seeing what they could observe through their own eyes. Only the summits of the Alps are bleak and bare. The valleys and foothills are covered with verdure. Forests of stately pines climb the sides of precipitous cliffs, which may be a thousand feet high. Here all is green, and there all is bare rock. In riding up the Jungfrau via Lauterbrunnen to the little Scheidig, more than a mile above the sea, one goes through a panorama of magnificent scenery with the Jungfrau in sight almost all the way. A part of the journey is through mighty canyons, the walls of which seem fortifications a thousand feet high and out of which spring waterfalls dropping almost sheer to the bottom. Now one is climbing over mountain pastures spotted with log huts, their great overhanging roofs held down with rocks, now passing through forests where the trees grow smaller and smaller until at the top they are stunted and flattened bushes that seem to be hugging the ground. There are many wildflowers, dandelions, buttercups, daisies, and farther up, violets as blue as the sky. The snow line is soon reached, and always one is in sight of the glaciers, which nestle between the mountain peaks. In some places, the glaciers move out over the cliffs and break, increasing with their icy walls the dizzy height of the precipices. These ice rivers wind about through the valleys of the giant mountains above, and one wonders whether there may not be a snow slide and trembles lest a terrible avalanche come down on the train. During our trip, a part of our way was cut through an avalanche that had rolled down this spring. It was a mass of a hundred acres of snow and ice, many feet thick, which could be seen above and below on both sides of the road. On the cleared track, the snow reached high over our cars. As we came out, I saw a broken telegraph pole which had been crushed by the slide. I had a convincing evidence here of the value of an experiment made to test the effect of the altitude upon tourists. The original idea was to run the railroad clear to the top of the Jungfrau, a height of 13,670 feet. It goes up by stages and has now reached Jungfrau Jok, which is 11,340 feet above the sea. One day it will probably be extended right to the summit and then an electric searchlight will be placed there, which will be visible from the Cathedral of Strasbourg on the north side of the Alps to the Cathedral of Milan on the south. When the railroad up the Jungfrau was projected, the government held up the enterprise on the ground that invalids and people of weak constitutions would be injured if suddenly lifted into the rarefied air of that altitude and the promoters had to prove that the trip could be safely made. They employed Dr. Regnard, an expert, to make a test upon two guinea pigs. The learned doctor put the pigs under a glass globe and then slowly lowered the atmospheric pressure within. One of the guinea pigs was put inside a wheel so that it had to run to keep from falling. The other was left squatting on the bottom of the globe. The experiment showed that a person can live when taken quickly to a considerable height above the sea, if he is quiet and remains there for only a short time. It also proved that if he takes exercise or overworks, he is almost sure to get the soroche, as mountain sickness is called. In coming up the Jungfrau, I had no trouble until I made my way up the steps from Jungfrau Jok out into the open. Then when I tried to hurry up the snowy path, leading a distance of perhaps 2,000 feet to the view, my heart straightway beat like a trip hammer, and I fell flat on the ground. After a little while, I sat down on a chunk of ice by the side of the path. My heart was soon quiet, and I was able to walk a few steps. I took the rest of the climb by relays of about three steps and a halt, and finally reached the top. Heretofore, I had been more than three miles above the sea, without bad effects as long as I took no severe exercise. In going up the Andes, I once reached a height of 15,865 feet, but I noticed that as I ascended, my feet seemed to grow heavy 
and the air was so thin that I hesitated to talk on account of the effect that speaking entailed. In the railroad tunnel inside the mountains, we found stations here and there, where the cars stopped to allow us to walk out through cross tunnels for the view. At some of these holes through the rock, we were right over glaciers that rolled on and on under our eyes. At the Icemere station, almost two miles above the sea, we were just over a great sea of snow of such dazzling whiteness under the sun that it was impossible to look out without dark glasses. The snow sea wound its way far down, in and out under the peaks of the Jungfrau and the Monch, until it was lost in a curve in the mountains. As I looked, two black figures on skis jumped from the station and flew like swallows down the icy surface. One of them tripped and rolled over and over, but he recovered his footing and followed his fellow, who was already a black speck in the distance. As we stood there with some of the world's most magnificent scenery all about us, I heard a party of American tourists talking. What do you think was the subject on which they were conversing so enthusiastically? Why eating and the prices of food? One man was telling how in a hotel in Germany he got a fine meal with wine for eight people for five dollars. The others laughed and held up their hands and then went on to discuss the cuisine of different hotels where they had stayed. As they continued, the smell and smoke of cooking seemed to rise and obscure one of the sublimest pictures on earth. But I knew that not all those near me were so unimpressed, for among them was a ten-year-old American boy whose earlier characteristic remarks had delighted my soul. My conviction that he was a Simon Pure American was born as we stood outside the Hotel Victoria in Interlaken, watching the wonderful alpine glow that comes just at sunset over the face of the Jungfrau. From this point, the Virgin, as she is called, is set in a framework of rocks and forests, and rises snow-white and pure, her head in the clouds. For perhaps five minutes during the sunset, her spotless silver turns almost to gold, and she looks more majestic than ever. It was at this moment that the boy came up and exclaimed as he looked, Gee, what a hill! During the trip, we saw many glaciers. I counted six on one mountainside at one time, and from here, on top of the Jungfrau, they are to be seen everywhere. There are twelve hundred of them, about evenly divided between the Swiss and the Austrian Alps. The glaciers of Switzerland are the largest and cover nearly half of the total area of 1,600 square miles of snow and ice in these mountains. To hear the Europeans talk, one would think that the Alps were the only really great features on the rugged face of old Mother Earth. I am willing to concede all they claim for their beauty, but when it comes to such expressions as the biggest, highest, and most stupendous that God ever created, I must voice my objection. It is true that these mountains are the backbone of Europe, but that is only a wishbone compared to the backbone of Asia. If you could take up the Alps and drop them into some of the larger valleys of the Himalayas, they would scarcely change the landscape in the Asiatic uplands, for they would be lost in their new surroundings. Here in the Alps there is not a beautiful view that is unmarred by a hotel and everywhere are people peddling sublimity. On the summit of the Jungfrau, and at all the mountain stations throughout the country, one finds women selling picture postcards, alpenstocks, and smoked glasses. At every stop I meet a Swiss maiden in a white blouse, a black velvet vest laced with white strings, a short red skirt, and a snowy white cap, who has pressed flowers, edelweiss, and carvings for sale. On the top of Mont Blanc, I was offered St. Bernard puppies with a repetition of the old story of how they rescue lost tourists, and whenever I go to sleep on a mountain, my rest is broken half an hour before sunrise by the horn of the guide tooting me up for the view. But, nevertheless, it is worth it. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Venice. Leaving Switzerland by sleeper, I made a night trip to Venice and awoke this morning just as my train started to cross the lagoons among which rises the Queen of the Adriatic. Looking out of my car window, 
i found we were passing over swamps cut into blocks of vegetation a little later the swamps disappeared there was no land at the side of the train and i could look far out over the water to a thin strip of green in the distance there were boats everywhere long caravans of coal boats pulled by tugs barges of freight moving this way and that motor boats chugging along after traveling for more than two miles through the water our train stopped at the station with the grand canal at the front steps i might have taken one of the small steamers that now ply along the main canals of the city but i preferred a gondola a long narrow boat with its prow and stern upturned so that they seemed to rise as high as my head like all the gondolas of venice it was painted jet black a fashion that dates back to the fifteenth century at that time the venetians were vying with each other in costly decorations on their boats to such an extent that a law was passed making black the universal rule my boat was not more than four feet wide and it wobbled as i plumped down in the seat in the centre the gondolier stood upright on the deck behind me and swayed as he pushed and pulled his one oar this way and that he knew the short cuts and took me down the grand canal and past the great palaces that line its whole length every time i come to venice i find it hard to realize what she is and still harder to realize what she was other cities are more or less alike venice is unique her population of two hundred thousand is crowded together into buildings that occupy a space about seven miles in circumference and appear to be afloat in the adriatic her streets are lanes of water on which boats serve as cabs moreover she is enriched by some of the most beautiful specimens of architecture in all italy and adorned with the master strokes of titian and tintoretti by the fifteenth century venice then in the zenith of her power was one of the great cities of the earth in her dockyards the largest in the world ten thousand beams of oak were always ready for the construction of new ships her merchant vessels sailed all the known seas her war galleys were feared from the rock of gibraltar to the bosporus and constantinople acknowledged her sway her ships passed beyond the golden horn and into the black sea to trade with russia and brought goods from asia to the port of venice whence they were carried over the alps to central and northern europe thus five hundred years ago before columbus had worked out his idea of a new way to the wealth of india and long before the age of modern invention and machinery venice held the gorgeous east in fee and was the safeguard of the west all this glorious past is the background of the venice of today though built upon piles driven into the earth the palaces stand up well and for the most part the city seems as solid as the traditional house built upon the rocks yet the houses appear everywhere to rise on no other foundation than the water one can scarcely realize that venice is really scattered over one hundred and seventeen islands and so has terra firma beneath her buildings hence the structures along its canals and streets do not lean drunkenly like many of those of rotterdam or amsterdam or other so-called venices i say streets advisedly since venice is a city of streets as well as canals the streets cut up the islands and cross the canals on four hundred bridges some of which are as beautifully arched as those of china or japan in a gondola trip one winds in and out through a labyrinth of one narrow waterway after another shadowed by span after span of stone the bridges are six or eight feet above the water and all freight carrying boats must be loaded with this in mind the oldest of the bridges is the rialto constructed in the sixteenth century to replace the earlier bridge of wood for centuries this was the only one over the grand canal it rises twenty-five feet above the water in a huge marble span of ninety feet little shops are built along it leaving a central alleyway about twenty feet wide between them and an outer passage on each side a stream of people is continually passing back and forth upon it for as in the days when the shrewd merchants of venice drove their hard bargains here and antonio pledged his pound of flesh to shylock 
this is still a busy quarter of the city standing on the peak of the rialto bridge one sees streets lined with awnings and filled with people a thing that strikes one in looking over venice is the fact that there is not much green i was about to say there are no trees but this is not true here and there the wealthy owner of a palace has had some earth brought in and has planted a tree in his courtyard some of the larger palaces have real gardens and there are places where terraces of vegetation rise up from the water to the ivy-covered marble structures along the grand canal riding through venice in a gondola one can easily imagine the cruelties of its past if he does not raise his eyes he might think he was in a city of prisons for the windows and doors of the lower stories are covered with rusty iron bars behind which is a heavy wire netting with a mesh so fine that your little finger would not go through i suppose though that these are merely precautions against theft the city is wonderfully quiet i know of no place less noisy except perhaps nijni novgorod the great fair city of russia between its annual events while the fair lasts it has perhaps three times as many people in it as the venice of today but for the remainder of the year it is as dead as nineveh and babylon or sodom and gomorrah after the fire sitting in a venetian gondola one does not hear the honk of the automobile the rumble of the motor truck the chug 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 of the motorcycle or even the clatter of horses feet upon the stone sidewalks in fact there is no street in venice that a man could safely ride through on horseback and there is none wide enough for a motorcycle with sidecar but let us be going to st mark's place the real heart of venice it is only three quarters of a mile from our hotel so we shall walk we pass along a busy street lined with shops and buzzing with tourists venice is forever alive with tourists a fact of which the storekeepers take the utmost advantage the shops remind us of those of atlantic city except that the goods displayed are more artistic scores of places sell only the beads or the leather goods for which the town is famed the throng is a gay one and there seems more life and color in it than in the crowds of the rue de la paix or the rue de rivoli in paris the people are well dressed venice used to be called a city of paupers and it may be one still but one would not judge so from our walk of this morning winding our way in and out through the narrow walls of stores we come at length to the piazza of st mark the patron saint of venice on three sides the great square is enclosed by marble palaces blackened by the wind and weather of years on the east side is the pride of the city the cathedral of st mark at first it was only the private chapel of the doge or chief magistrate of the old republic of venice but it grew in size and importance with the growth of the city-state a law required every merchant trading to the east to bring back something for the adornment of the church in richness of material and decoration it is said to be unique among all the churches of the earth st mark's covers acres and is a veritable museum of wonders volumes have been written about its beauties and its treasures but i shall write only of the mosaics covering its walls and ceilings they are on a golden background which has given the cathedral the name of the church of gold some of the work dates back to the tenth century here are the stories of the bible told in pictures made of millions of pieces of enamel marble and gold leaf set together some represent only old testament subjects in one dome are shown the creation of the world and the fall of man in the next are pictured the flood the ark with noah and the tower of babel here are portrayed pictures of joseph being sold down into egypt by his brothers and all the incidents of the history of moses you may read the life of christ in these mosaics and the wonderful happenings in the lives of the saints the marvel about it is that the little pieces of which these pictures are made are each not larger than your little fingernail if you will take four hundred and fifty ordinary city lots and pave them with mosaics so that every inch of the space is a picture made up of bits of this kind you may get some idea of the labor the mosaic decoration of st mark's represents leaving the cathedral one passes beneath the four bronze horses which no one knows how old through the centuries they have traveled many a mile 
they were apparently designed for some roman general's triumphal arch but by whose hand remains a mystery at any rate in 1204 the doge of venice brought them to a city from constantinople here they remained for nearly 600 years then napoleon carried them off and set them up in paris from the shadow of the tuileries they watched his triumphs but not for long after waterloo they were restored to venice and mounted once more upon their pedestals even then they could not rest undisturbed a century later when the city feared extinction from the enemy airplanes continually flying back and forth over her and dropping bombs from the skies the bronze horses of st mark's were taken down and hidden away after the world war had ended they were brought out and set again on their vantage point overlooking the piazza as i gazed up at these beautiful glittering horses today i saw at least five hundred pigeons perched upon them i can't give the actual count but there were thousands of live pigeons hovering over st mark's and filling the great square in front of it they nest in the nooks of the palaces surrounding the square which they practically own no one thinks of disturbing them and a venetian boy with a bean shooter who would kill one of those birds would go instantly to prison in some way or other the people have the idea that they mean good luck to the city in olden times they were sent out from the vestibule of the cathedral on palm sunday and during the time of the republic they were fed at government expense there are literally swarms of them and one can sit and watch their antics as they feed and play a good business in the square is making photographs of the pigeons eating out of the hands and even from the heads of the tourists there are peddlers who sell corn split peas and beans to those who wish to feed the birds and the photographers will take about a half pint of the grain and pour it over your hands and even on your head as soon as they drop the corn on you the pigeons come in swarms i tried holding out my hands and soon had so many gathered there that my arms ached with their weight they flutter down also on my head sinking their claws into the wool of my cap and finally pulling it off from st mark's a smaller plaza the piazzetta stretches down to the waters on the edge of the piazzetta rise two granite columns brought from syria or constantinople and set up here in the twelfth century one column is capped by a statue of saint theodore once patron saint of the republic standing on a crocodile while on the other is the winged lion of saint mark the venetians have a phrase between theodore and mark which means about the same as our between hammer and anvil or between the devil and the deep blue sea the saying probably comes from the fact that once state offenders were put to death on a scaffold set up between these columns their backs were always turned to the city that had cast them off while their faces looked out to see the symbol of eternity now the old shafts throw their shadows upon dozens of gondolas tied up at the canal pier and instead of the cries of the condemned one hears the soft italian voices of the gondoliers chanting each the advantages of his craft for a swift row up the Grand Canal and back to one's hotel. End of chapter 6。Chapter 7 of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Over the Plains of Lombardy to Milan. Today I've been riding over the Lombardy Plain from venice to milan to the north i could see the low foothills of the alps gradually rising till they met the sky and to the south the fertile fields going on and on to the horizon the whole country is a garden where the luxuriant crops stand out against a background of reddish brown soil in the middle ages the wool industry of this region was important now silk has taken the place of wool and there are great groves of mulberry trees with other crops growing between the rows when the austrian troops held this district so much money was made from silk culture that it was said the soldiers and the officers lived on mulberry leaves no wonder the sight of these rich plains put heart into the cohorts of hannibal when exhausted by their march over the alps they looked down upon them and thought of the loot they might yield 
no wonder that nearly two thousand years later napoleon's men were inspired by the fruitfulness of the fields to sweep down from the mountain passes upon the austrian forces the po the largest river in italy flows along most of the southern boundary of lombardy while part of its western border is formed by the ticino one of the chief tributaries of the po in the plain are most of the beautiful italian lakes the climate is hot in summer but in winter bitterly cold winds bear down upon it from the mountains the farmers offset the scanty rainfall of the summers by a system of irrigation works begun in the middle ages and still so serviceable that it is almost impossible for the crops to fail for lack of water the scenes here are different from those of other parts of europe there are more buildings in the midst of the fields and more of the people live out on the farms instead of in villages the cottages are usually of brick covered with stucco it is said that six out of every ten of the people in italy are on the land and that only about ten per cent of her nearly one hundred and eleven thousand square miles of area is useless or uncultivated this one-tenth is barren rock it is true that there is much mountainous country that can never be put to the plough, but grapes and olives grow on stony slopes, and chestnuts, which are an important food of the people, flourish on the mountain sides. The land is intensively cultivated, so that I seem to be rolling through a succession of truck patches. Mixed farming appears to be the rule. It is a tradition of the Italian farmer that his bread shall be made of his own wheat his salad mixed with his own olive oil, and his wine pressed from the grapes out of his own vineyard. Corn and rice grow side by side with the vineyards, and mulberry trees compete for their share of the sustenance. From maize, called by the Italian farmer Turkish corn, the people make polenta, which is almost as popular with them as macaroni. Now and then I saw kilns for drying out the corn. These were installed when it was thought that pellagra, the scourge of the italian peasants was due to eating damp musty corn the old method of hanging the corn outside the house in the sun still prevails however and in autumn the garlands of golden grain add to the picturesqueness of the landscape the worst cases of pellagra are now taken to hospitals for special diet and nursing a victim of the disease who is allowed to remain at home is supplied with salt free of charge salt is a government monopoly in italy and its price often puts it beyond the reach of the poorest peasants it is against the law even to take home a bucket of sea water to get the salt from as in other parts of italy many of the farms of lombardy are rented there are several rental systems but perhaps the best is that known as meseria under which the tenant gets half the crop a house a shed for his cattle and a vat for wine-making are furnished him, and he also has the right to a certain number of the eggs from his hens. The landlord pays for all improvements and supplies half the oxen. In the case of a bad harvest, the landlord must provide seed grain for the next planting. The rented farm is generally small, ranging from 10 to 25 acres. The government agricultural experts estimate that there should be a man to every two and a half acres. Much of the irrigated area belongs to big landowners, syndicates, or development companies. One class of laborers on such estates lives on the land rent-free, drawing wages partly in cash and partly in kind. The members of the other class hire out for the best wages they can get and maintain themselves in mean little villages. Everywhere the vineyards are carefully tended, more so now, as a matter of fact, than ever before, for the government is trying to uproot the old haphazard methods of the past eternal vigilance is the price of wine in italy especially in the hill country here the wind is a great foe rushing down in september rubbing the bunches of grapes together and knocking off or bruising the fruit so that it does not come to the right maturity and sweetness the peasants have a saying that the wind has drunk a great deal of wine Another enemy of the grapes and of other crops as well is hail. In many districts, the people shoot into the hail-laden clouds in the hope of breaking them up before their downpour can destroy the crops. 
in some places at the time of the grape harvest approaches the leaves are stripped from the vines so that the sun may shine full on the fruit but in others they are left on so as to protect it from hail as the grapes ripen the vineyard owner his wife and his children mount guard night and day against thieves when the vintage begins ox carts carrying big tubs are driven among the vines to gather up the grapes picked into baskets by the harvesters it is considered a sign of a good harvest if swarms of earwigs troop out of the tubs when they are taken from where they have been stored since the previous season the fruit is pressed in the vats in the wine cellars and while machinery is being used more and more for this work many maintain that the old way is the best these winemakers claim that the mechanical presses squeeze the stems and seeds whereas the elastic tread of the human foot is exactly what is needed to get only the best from the grape some of italy's wine is still trodden out by the feet of girls and boys in just the same process that horace celebrates in his odes wooden shoes fitted with spikes in the soles are worn for this purpose in the last half century italy has undergone an agricultural revolution it used to be that agriculture was considered no proper pursuit for the well-born and well-educated a father of the upper classes wished to see his son a graduate of a university with the title of doctor in this or that branch of learning then somebody hit on the happy thought of granting the title of doctor to those completing a course of study in a high school of agriculture and soon the attitude toward scientific farming as a profession underwent a change italy now has a number of agricultural colleges and special schools for teaching oil and cheese making fruit culture and cattle breeding scattered throughout the country are experimental farms and in some districts the government lends agricultural machinery to the farmers for two weeks at a time rural credit associations and village banks have been organized to make loans to the small farmers there are also cooperative banks that accept deposits of the smallest sums and lend money on simple notes of hand endorsed by one or two signatures italy is also the home of the international institute of agriculture founded at rome to carry out the idea of an american david lubin this unique organization gathers crop reports from all over the world and collects information about farm labor and other matters relating to agriculture 52 nations support the institute italy has doubled her farm production in the past 50 years she grows more wheat than anything else and after that come corn and rice she ranks next to france as a wine producer making more than a million gallons a year a glance at a physical map of the country will show you that most of the level land is in lombardy plain at the top of the italian boot are the alps while down the leg runs the long low range of the apennines the alps formerly cut off italy from the rest of europe but this barrier has been overcome by the railroads in the trough between the two mountain systems lies lombardy which has been built up by earth washings brought down by the streams within the last six centuries the delta of the po has added to the land surface an area equal to eight hundred farms of a quarter section each and the ancient port of adria which gave its name to the adriatic is now fifteen miles inland though italy is in the same latitude as indiana its climate is more like that of florida for the peninsula gets warm breezes from africa and the mediterranean in the southern part and in sicily lemons oranges figs and other subtropical fruits grow as well as in southern california the country has little valuable iron ore and practically no good coal so that she must import fuel for her factories but development of her abundant water power which is being vigorously pushed will eventually make her independent of foreign coal it is estimated that italy has in her rivers and streams a total of 12 million horsepower if this were all developed it would mean the equivalent of 60 million tons of coal in a year like switzerland she has a great program for the electrification of four thousand miles or nearly half of her railroads most of which are operated by the government her dependence on foreign raw materials is one of italy's great problems she must bring in besides coal nearly half her food as well as the cotton 
and the wool needed by our factories the truth is the country has a great many mouths to feed in proportion to its size if the united states were as thickly populated we should have one thousand million people or nearly ten times as many as we have now in an area about equal to that of new mexico italy is supporting a population of more than thirty eight millions or three hundred and forty to the square mile overpopulation has caused much poverty especially in the southern part of the country and has led to extensive emigration the fact that the united states which used to admit a large percentage of italian immigrants now restricts their numbers is a hardship for this country not only did the departure of the immigrants mean fewer stomachs to be filled but the money they returned to their native land was an important part of the national income while lombardy has more than five hundred and forty people to the square mile it is agriculturally and commercially the most prosperous section of the country again and again especially as we neared milan i was impressed with the flourishing industrial life of the region we passed the linen mills woolen mills silk mills and machine shops and finally drove into milan italy's chief railway center and silk market and one of the three big industrial cities of the country genoa the principal seaport and a rival of marseilles is one of milan's commercial competitors and turin where the fiat cars are made in the largest automobile factory of europe is the other after the quiet and dreaminess of venice milan seems to have the atmosphere of a pittsburgh or a chicago indeed it is the most modern city in italy and looks in some respects like an american town in shape it is a polygon and its center is the fine piazza del duomo from which many broad streets radiate in all directions these streets are connected by an inner circle of boulevards constructed just outside a canal this canal marks the site of the moat of the medieval city for despite her up-to-date appearance milan is very old some of the streets are wide it is true but others are so narrow that motor cars have to drive carefully in passing prominent features of the business section are the arcades here and there the principal one is that of victor emmanuel in the heart of the city and within a stone's throw of the cathedral this great arcade which is about one hundred feet high and nearly as wide is beautifully decorated its ceiling is of glass which at night is brilliantly lighted by electricity the floors are in mosaic the arcade is lined with fine stores the big display windows looking out on the passages like the piazza san marco in venice it is the great meeting promenade and dining place of the city all day long it is alive with shoppers and in the evening is filled with the world of Milan and his wife. Beautiful women and girls and handsome, bareheaded men walk back and forth until 12 o'clock at night. The biggest and best thing in Milan is the cathedral, which occupies one end of the Piazza del Duomo. It dates back to 1386 and is built of brick cased in white marble. The stone is sadly smoke-stained since the city has become a manufacturing center, but the whole is still most beautiful. The buttresses and roof are adorned with 135 pinnacles and 2,300 marble statues decorate the exterior. It is covered with carvings in high and low relief representing scenes from the scriptures, almost every one of them a work of fine art. The interior is wonderfully impressive. The building is in the form of a cross. The huge columns of pink marble upholding the mighty roof are of indescribable beauty and slenderness and i defy any man no matter what his religion to go through this cathedral unmoved forty thousand people may gather here at one time and unite in the worship of god who gave to man the mind to conceive and the power to execute such a masterpiece besides being enriched with noble buildings and artistic masterpieces handed down from the past milan has vast wealth gained from her industries and her part in the productive enterprises of northern italy the city is the chief financial center of italy its bankers and commercial magnates do business with all the world genoa italy's principal port is less than one hundred miles distant and it is the mouth through which the factories and the mills are fed with the raw materials from abroad 
It has direct steamship service to all Mediterranean ports, to England, New York, Asia, and Australia. Here are landed coal from Great Britain, cotton from the United States, cottonseed oil from mixing with the native oil, and iron, petroleum, and other products. Although Genoa's exports are large, they are usually far exceeded in value by her imports. Since the completion of the St. Goddard Tunnel through the Alps, this port has become also an outlet for the manufactured goods of Switzerland, southern Germany, and part of Austria. The city itself is only about half the size of Milan. Like an amphitheater, it rises from the water in a series of tiers and terraces on which are many splendid marble palaces. Every American schoolboy knows of Genoa as the birthplace of Columbus, but it took the Genoese nearly 400 years to decide to honor the discoverer of America with a statue which now stands before the railway station. John Cabot, who saw the coast of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia before Columbus set foot on continental America, was also born in Genoa. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. The Eternal City. Go thou to Rome at once, the paradise, the grave, the city, and the wilderness. So said Keats. Yet I think Rome is less than a paradise, more than a city, and far more than a wilderness of ruins, or the grave of an ancient civilization. There are many Romes, the Rome of the Forum and the Colosseum, the Rome of St. Peter's and the Pope, the Rome of the King and Government of Italy, the Rome of the Artist, the Archaeologist, and the Historian, and the combination of all these, the Eternal City, that is the pride of the Italians and the Port of Dreams for thousands. I am reminded of a story told of the learned Pope Leo the Thirteenth. He often asked the foreign visitor, How long have you been in Rome? If the answer was, A week, Your Holiness, the pontiff would say, Then you must feel as if you know Rome very well. If the visitor replied that he had been in the city for six months, Pope Leo's remark would be, Then you have begun to look about you a little bit. But if the foreigner should say that he had lived in Rome for several years, the Pope would smilingly say, Ah, then you have discovered that a whole lifetime is not too long to learn what Rome really is. The city seems enormous, for it is spread over an immense area. One reason for this is the fact that a large part of it is taken up with ruins, churches, and historic monuments of one kind or another. The town is actually no larger than St. Louis or Boston, but if you were to reproduce Rome on the site of either of the others, you would have to allot a big space in the heart of it for the relics of the past. The forum, as big as an 80-acre farm, is surrounded by the business buildings of modern Rome. The Colosseum is another great field of stone and mortar, right in the midst of the business section. St. Peter's and the Vatican occupy as much land as the Colosseum. Almost anywhere you could throw a stone and hit a church taking up an acre or so of ground. Most of the city is on the left bank of the Tiber, rising partly on the plain of the ancient field of Mars and partly on the surrounding hills. On the right bank of the river are St. Peter's and the Vatican. Modern Rome is confined chiefly to the plain. The heights where stood the ancient mistress of the world were almost uninhabited during the Middle Ages, and only within comparatively recent years have they begun to be reoccupied. Yet these seven hills of Rome add greatly to its beauty. The Palatine, where Cicero lived, and where Augustus, the first of the Roman emperors, built his huge palace, is now a park, and verdure hides the ruins of the halls where succeeding emperors lorded it over the multitude. A curious relic here is a little stone altar chiseled with the Latin words. Say Dio say di voi, to the unknown God. I have been told that this was set up to the patron God of Rome, and that only the priests knew the name of the deity to whom it was really dedicated. Even they did not write it down, but handed it on from generation to generation, for it was feared that if the common people should know it, one of them might betray it to an enemy, 
who would surely bribe the god with offerings and sacrifices to cease to protect rome between the palatine and the capitoline on which rose the magnificent temple of jupiter the most sacred shrine of the roman world are the ruins of the forum upon the quirinal is the royal palace of the kings of italy on the sides of the viminal the modern city grows apace last night i dined upon the aventine not going up in a chariot on horseback or afoot as did caesar and cicero but in an italian automobile which landed me at the castle of the caesars climbing some ragged stone steps past ruined columns we came out at length upon a stone platform where a gay crowd was dining in the open-air restaurant overlooking the myriad lights of the city as we ate delicious food amid the laughter and light talk of the twentieth century my imagination unreeled before me a series of moving pictures first i saw in my mind's eye the burial of remus upon this hillside after he had been slain by romulus in a fit of jealous rage that was twenty-six centuries and more ago next i beheld these slopes alive with the surging mob of plebeians their hearts aflame with the injustices and oppressions of the patricians there followed terrible pictures of the wild orgies of seven thousand men and women engaged in their degrading worship of bacchus again the scene changed and across my mental screen flitted a figure frail and small yet with an indescribable dignity of bearing he moved about in a cluster of men with dark hebraic countenances and long beards who appeared to be hanging upon his every word and recalling that he was a visitor to jews of the rome of two thousand years ago i gave the picture a title paul a servant of jesus christ called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of god but here my reverie was interrupted by the waiter presenting me with such a substantial bill that i came back with a jolt to the world of today since the spell was broken i climbed into my car and was soon again in the midst of modern rome the principal streets of the business city of rome are the via nazionale and its continuation the corso one of the most brilliant avenues in all europe during the season both of these thoroughfares are thronged with pedestrians and vehicles a large part of the traffic of rome is still pulled along by horses though the taxis are also numerous and cheap the old-fashioned victoria drawn by one horse which the driver usually flogs unmercifully is most prevalent there are also red street cars which are a bit shorter than ours and get their power through overhead trolleys carts drawn by mules decorated with bells and colored fringes so that they look as if they were ready for a holiday bump over the cobbled pavements donkey carts are not so common here as in naples one of the striking things about rome is the number and the beauty of its fountains the finest of them is the trevi which used to be called virgin water either because of its purity or because of the tradition that a young girl pointed out this spring to the engineers of agrippa they built a subterranean channel fourteen miles long to conduct the stream that issues here to the baths of that warrior and statesman beside the pantheon the same aqueduct restored from time to time carries daily more than seventeen and a half million gallons of the best water in rome the trevi is in the heart of the city and in the evenings the people gather here and listen to its splashings there is a tradition that the traveler who throws a small coin into these waters will surely return to rome as i stood on the edge of it yesterday i asked my guide how much shall i throw from the crowd of loafers sitting on the edge of the fountain came in accents unmistakably of the lower west side of new york throw in a dollar and i'll dive and get it evidently here was one of the many returned sons of italy who had brought back from america some of our own ideas of what is good business this morning i crossed the tiber to st peter's there are many bridges but i happen to take the one named for king humbert the first the beloved italian monarch assassinated at the beginning of this century dominating the bridge on the right bank is the great palace of justice of which my guide remarked it is a big palace but has little justice under the shadow of the huge pile i saw a hundred or so young romans swimming and diving 
dodging about in canoes or sunning themselves on the sand. The Tiber was neither so swift nor so tawny as it often is. Sometimes it is a raging torrent of yellow water that comes tearing down from the Apennines full of the sediment it has gathered from the mountains and the Compagna. Because of past disastrous floods, the government has enclosed it with massive stone masonry, so that, seen from a height, the river looks like a walled fosse of the Middle Ages. One day, perhaps, the talk of making a ship canal of the Tiber so as to bring the Mediterranean right into the city may end in action. Rome is only about half an hour by motor from the sea, and if it were in the United States, the canal would probably have been built long ago. All the plans and the specifications are ready, and only the money is lacking. The approach to St. Peter's is through a great plaza in the shape of an ellipse. From the cathedral, stone colonnades, surmounted by more than 150 statues of saints, curve in half crescents about both sides of the space. Two fountains play in the plaza, and in the middle is the obelisk, which the Emperor Caligula brought from Heliopolis, the city of the sun god in the Nile Delta. It was first set up in the Vatican Circus at Rome, where Nero held his shows and chariot races, and practiced his horrible cruelties upon the early Christians. In the 16th century, the obelisk was removed from that site to the space in front of St. Peter's. There is a story that Pope Sixtus V, who had ordered its removal, had decreed that there should be absolute silence as the obelisk was raised. But just as the men had hauled it almost to the perpendicular, it was seen that one of the ropes was slipping. Then a sailor in the crowd yelled out, throw water on the rope. His advice was followed, the rope tightened, and the obelisk went safely into place. The crowd held its breath at the thought of what would befall him for having disobeyed the Pope's command. But instead of punishment, his family was forever awarded the privilege of supplying palms to St. Peter's on Palm Sunday. Sixtus V, by the way, was that strong man of his day, of whom Queen Elizabeth declared, He is the one man who is worthy of my hand. Though the plaza forms a magnificent approach to the greatest church in Christendom, the cathedral is best viewed from a distant height, so that one may get the full effect of Michelangelo's vast dome. Seen from the level, the dome is dwarfed by the great façade stretching across the front of the church. When measured by the eye in close perspective, St. Peter's does not seem as tall as the Capitol at Washington, though it is in reality twice as high. The interior is enormously impressive. One can scarcely take in the immense size of the church and the huge scale on which every detail is worked out. For example, the two fonts for holy water near the entrance to the nave have marble basins upheld by cherubs. When I looked at them from the door, these cherubs seemed to be about the size of the average baby. But when I stood beside them, I saw that the leg of each one was as big around as my waist and that its head would have been a tight fit in a half-bushel basket. Looking across the nave, I saw the people on the other side as mere pygmies. So perfect are the proportions of the whole that it takes such comparisons as these to make one realize that here is space for 80,000 people to gather at once. The statue of St. Peter is a sitting figure of more than life size, cast in bronze that looks as if it had been alloyed with silver or pewter. Although it is not by any means beautiful, the statue is rather imposing. The head is very ugly, with hair and beard of short, tight curls. In the right hand, the founder of the church holds a key, while the left is raised in blessing. The right foot has been kissed by so many thousands of worshippers that it is smooth and shiny, and the first three toes have been worn down for an inch or more. Some say that the statue was made in the 5th century, others that it is as recent as the 13th. One story has it that it was originally a statue of Jupiter and was remodeled by the Christians who put on a new head and new arms. I do not by any means vouch for the truth of this tale, but it does seem to me that the bronze toga draped about the saint might have been designed for a pagan image and the head does not appear to belong with the body. Beneath the dome stands the high altar where only the Pope may read Mass. Above it is a bronze canopy 
95 feet high, made from metal taken from the Pantheon. In front of the altar is the tomb of St. Peter, to which one descends by marble steps. On the balustrade about the crypt are nearly 100 lighted gold lamps. Something like 500 years ago, the Roman nobles made up a fund to keep these lights burning for all time to come, and they have been glowing here ever since. Only the body of St. Peter rests in his cathedral. His head is interred with that of St. Paul beneath the high altar of St. John in the Lateran, called the mother and head of all churches. This church, which is in the eastern section of the city, was a part of the old Lateran palace bestowed by Constantine on the Pope of his day. Until the 14th century, when Gregory XI established the official residence at the Vatican, the Lateran was the home of the popes. It is still a part of the Papal See and is used as a museum of Christian and secular antiquities. St. John's has suffered so much from fire, earthquake, pillage, and the hand of the restorer that it is now little save a big modern church. I found much more interesting the Scala Santa, the building near the Lateran that contains the 28 marble steps which Christ is said to have ascended when they formed the stairway of Pilate's house in Jerusalem. They are covered over with wood to keep them from being worn away, for they may be ascended only on the knees, and generations of pilgrims have climbed thus from the lowest to the topmost step. Pius the Ninth himself made the painful ascent in 1870, on the eve of the entry of the Italian troops into Rome, when the temporal power of the popes came to an end. It was while toiling up the sacred stairs that Luther heard a voice from heaven declaring that the way to salvation was by faith as well as by works. At Easter time, especially on Good Friday, many kneeling Catholics go up the flight, but fortunately for those not so devoutly inclined, there is a stairway on each side that may be used in the ordinary way. At the top of the steps one may look down through a barred window into the Sancta Sanctorum, consecrated as the private chapel of the Popes. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of The Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. The Grandeur That Was Rome. The greater part of today I have spent in the Roman Forum, the spot on which perhaps more history has been enacted than on any other of the globe. My inward eye is still dazzled by hundreds of pictures showing the story of Rome from the time that Romulus and Remus fought over laying her foundations, through the proud days when she was mistress of the known world until she lay exhausted and despoiled by the Vandals. Twelve hundred years of history, much of it most glorious, are mirrored in the ruins about the old marketplace and center of the Roman people. The Forum is now a great sunken space with masses of debris covering the stone floor. The remains of columns and capitals lie here, and there and the ruins of the storied buildings of the past rise from it here is an old palace wall the corinthian column showing all that is left of its wonderful beauty flowers are growing in the forum and trees have sprung up among the stones i notice the flaming blossoms of the hibiscus on the edge of the old palace of caligula and picked a daisy from a crevice in the temple of marcus aurelius I saw what seemed to me a rose flowering in the gray vault of Caesar and thought of Omar Khayyam's. I sometimes think that never blows so red the rose as where some buried Caesar bled, that every hyacinth the garden wears dropped in her lap from some once lovely head. A little more than a century ago, this treasure vault of archaeology was merely a cow pasture, far down beneath which lay the annals of Rome. Early in the 19th century, systematic exploration and excavation began. After Italy became a united kingdom, the government took charge of the work, so that the most ancient days of the city have been brought back to us by the remains unearthed. The space between the Palatine and the Capitoline, now occupied by the Forum, was once a swamp, in the midst of which was the Lake of Curtius. Into this lake plunged the Sabine leader, when hard-pressed by the Romans after the rape of the Sabine women. 
here appeared a yawning chasm which threatened to engulf the young city and which the soothsayers declared would not close until rome's most valuable possession was thrown into it then marcus curtius a youth of noble birth vowing that rome could have nothing more precious than a brave citizen rode fully armed into the chasm which immediately closed over him in the sixth century b c the marshy plain was drained and became the civic center of rome here assemblies were held orders declaimed and athletes gave exhibitions while the people looked on from the galleries built over the surrounding porticos there were also shops of various kinds those were the days when the soldier virginius snatched a knife from a butcher's block in the forum and plunged it into the heart of his beautiful young daughter virginia rather than have her fall a victim to the lust of apius claudius the december but with the growth of the city and its business more than one forum was needed and a number of judicial and mercantile fora were established while the forum romanum was enlarged and beautified the forum was more than half a mile long and about half as wide in the days of the empire it was surrounded by magnificent temples and palaces the remains of some of which may still be studied whole books have been written about these fragments and years of study could be put on all for which they stand but i shall have to content myself with telling you of only a few of the things that interested me at the northwestern side of the forum rises the marble arch erected seventeen hundred years ago to the emperor septimius severus by his two sons caracalla and geta but geta's name is not now on the inscription across the front for caracalla erased it after he'd had his brother and co-emperor murdered in his mother's arms on one side of the arch is a round brick core the remainder of the umbilicus the monument once marking the exact center of the city almost in the shadow of the arch is the black stone a square of ground paved in black marble inscribed in an ancient tongue and said to mark the grave of romulus nearly opposite the arch of septimius severus at this end of the forum rise the eight granite columns of the temple of saturn which was dedicated to the god of crops five hundred years before christ in the cellars of the temple were stored the public funds here and there on the paving of the forum one sees coins half melted and sunk into the stone the explanation is that once when the temple was on fire the money was transferred from the burning building and in the hurry some of it was dropped and left on the floor the italian government which is extremely careful of its antiquities has protected many of these coins by covering them with glass on the road in front of the temple have been found traces of the golden milestone set up by the emperor augustus in the glorious times when all roads led to rome upon this column were inscribed the names and distances of the chief towns on the highways radiating from the city the milestone stood at the foot of a flight of steps leading up to the rostrum from which cicero thundered forth some of his attacks upon mark antony when caesar had been killed and antony was in control cicero balked by unfavorable winds in his efforts to flee by ship returned to his villa exclaiming let me die in the country which i have so often saved he was killed by a man he had befriended and his head was brought to antony and his wife fulvia as they sat at a banquet antony heaped abuses on it and fulvia drew a gold pin from her hair and thrust it through the tongue that had said so much against her and her husband then the head and the hands of the greatest order of rome were nailed to the rostrum this platform was a stone structure seventy-eight feet long and forty feet wide adorned with statues and tablets in front of the temple tomb of julius caesar on the eastern end of the forum was the julian rostrum here stood antony with the bloody garment of the murdered caesar and swayed the mob by his wonderful oration until they were ready to do his will only thirteen years later augustus decorated this platform with the beaks of the ships he had captured at the battle of actium where he won from antony the mastery of the world most beautiful are the three parian marble columns nearly fifty feet tall 
and five feet in diameter which were once part of a majestic temple to castor and pollux a shrine was built to these twin gods in memory of the help they gave the romans in their fight against the league of latin cities about five hundred years before christ was born you recall the story of how the romans under Aulus, were sore beset when all at once at the head of their ranks there appeared a princely pair clad in white armor and mounted upon snowy steeds then rome to the charge cried Aulus. the foe begins to yield charge for the hearth of vesta charge for the golden shield let no man stop to plunder but slay and slay and slay the gods who live for ever are on our side to-day and close by the temple ruins there still bubbles the fountain where after the battle was won and they had galloped to rome with the good news castor and pollux washed their gory horses in the well that springs by vesta's fane and straight away they mounted and rode to vesta's door then like a blast away they passed and no man saw them more near this fountain of juturna are the remains of the circular temple of vesta where the sacred fire was always kept alight by the vestal virgins in the shrine were treasured the seven sacred objects upon possession of which depended the safety of rome the most important of these was the palladium the crude statue of minerva that aeneas brought with him from troy the sacred shield that fell from heaven in the time of the good old king numa the founder of the order of the vestals was confided to special priests and not to the shrine of vesta besides keeping the fire burning on the altar the virgins had to offer daily prayers for the welfare of the state and bring water every day from a sacred spring for the ceremonial sweeping and sprinkling of the temple if any of them allowed the fire to go out she was scourged by the pontifex maximus or high priest while the vestal who broke her vow of chastity was buried alive judging by the remains of their home near the temple the vestals lived well on the upper floor of the two-story building may be traced a suite of baths and sleeping rooms lined with polished marble and paved with mosaics on the lower floor are the ruins of storerooms a kitchen and quarters for the slaves appointed by the government to serve these priestesses in one part of the building are statues of the chief vestals who acted somewhat as mother superiors to the others the inscriptions on some of them show that they were erected by people grateful for favors secured for them by the influence of the vestals indeed the virgins were a privileged and influential group they occupied the best seats at the theaters and were allowed to go to the gladiatorial combats they took a prominent part in all the religious and state ceremonies were exempt from taxation and might drive through the streets in carriages after their thirty years of service to the state they might retire to private life and even marry but judging by the faces of the statues i saw i should say they seldom got proposals from one pedestal the name and inscription have been erased because the vestal to whom the statue was set up became a christian in three hundred sixty four a d this was at the time when the worship of vesta was dying out and there is a story that along about the end of the fourth century the wife of a vandal chieftain took a valuable necklace from one of the statues as she laughed at the remonstrances of a lone old hag the last survivor of the vestal virgins as i sat in the forum thinking of these things i heard a guttural whirr in the air and looking up i saw an airplane cutting the sky overhead what i wonder do the ghosts of the vestals think of such things when they return and hover about their old home i can imagine that business in the forum sometimes adjourned so that the people might hurry over to shows in the coliseum close by just as our national legislators take an afternoon off to go to the ball game i have seen this great amphitheater under almost every change of aspect it has known for the last generation when i came here first it was covered with moss and nature seemed to be trying to hide some of the wounds of time today in the bright sunlight the ruins look as bare and gray as an old rain-washed bone the moss of the ages has been scraped away and the structure looks as if it had had a bath of soap and lye and ashes 
as i photographed it this afternoon a ten-ton truck came rumbling by and the smell of gasoline rose to my nostrils when i went again to see it this evening the whole thing had changed the moon gave just enough light to smooth all the rough edges and to touch the giant ruin with beauty i strolled about the arena climbed up into the various rows of galleries and finally sat down in what twenty-five hundred years ago were the bleachers and tried to picture the ancient spectacle gladiators christian martyrs lions and tigers with jaws dripping with the blood of the followers of christ all passed under my eyes i could imagine the scene in quo vadis in which the beautiful maiden is brought into the ring tied to the horns of a bull i could see the mimic naval engagements when the arena was flooded and the forces on the boats fought for the entertainment of the spectators i saw great walls as high as a sixteen-story building alive with a mass of humanity some say that eighty-seven thousand people could be accommodated here at one time others put the number at fifty thousand after the Colosseum was completed by the emperor titus the conqueror of jerusalem it was dedicated with one hundred days of gladiatorial combats and contests between men and beasts five thousand animals were killed and fully one hundred men a hundred and seventy years later shows almost as stupendous were staged here by the emperor philip in celebration of the thousandth anniversary of the founding of the city at last constantine forbade throwing christians to the wild beasts and in four hundred five honorius put a stop to gladiatorial combats it was in that year so the story goes that the monk telemachus rushed into the arena in the midst of the gladiators and commanded them in the name of the saviour to leave off slaughtering one another he himself was slain by the enraged combatants but his death made a great impression on the spectators wild beasts were baited in the arena for another hundred years however and it was not until the sixth century that the building was abandoned to the ravages of time lightning and earthquakes from the fifteenth to the seventeenth century the Colosseum, like the other imperial ruins of rome served as a quarry for builders the marble facing was torn off the metal clamps that held its slabs and blocks together were gouged out when iron was scarce statues and frescoes were carried away and stonemasons even burned marble from it in their kilns to make lime the amphitheatre was used as a fort for markets and shops and once it even housed a woolen factory in 1750 pope benedict the 14th consecrated the Colosseum by setting up the stations of the cross inside it and thus ended further vandalism thirty thousand jewish captives are said to have worked on the construction of the mighty amphitheater it is built in the form of an ellipse and covers six acres the walls rise to a height of a hundred and sixty feet in four tiers and there are eighty archways serving as entrances all except four were for the admission of the public two were for the gladiators and the processions and two were reserved for the emperor and his court and for the high officials beneath the arena were corridors leading to the dens of the wild beasts which were lifted by machinery through trap doors to the level of the stage the spectators were shielded from rain or sun by immense sailcloths manipulated by detachments of sailors from the fleet in the bay of naples i included naples in my itinerary this time especially because of the excavations at pompeii which have revealed even more fully than have those at the forum the everyday life under roman civilization since seventeen forty eight when a peasant's spade happened to turn up some ancient utensils workmen have been delving there and bringing to light bit by bit the life of the city buried and lost for eighteen hundred years all this is easily reached on the cars from naples which make the sixteen mile run in an hour we go out through the most densely populated the noisiest and the smelliest town in europe the streets of naples especially in the tenement district and along the seafront overflow with men women children goats donkeys carts and wagons and reek with the odors of cooking drying linen fish garlic unwashed humanity the sea 
and nobody knows what else besides there are men selling fish and women frying potatoes rice balls and all sorts of indigestible things in kettles of dingy boiling lard goats are being driven into the houses and up the stairs to be milked at the doors of customers apartments the people seem to live in the streets making here their toilets and their love with the same lack of embarrassment gangs of boys and men stretched at full length on the pavement doze in the hot sun from the balconies of the blue pink white violet or bright yellow houses hang laundry rags and strings of new-made spaghetti in the midst of these bloom flower boxes that often adorn even the poorest tenement windows naples which is about the same size as baltimore or boston is the largest city and second seaport of italy it deserves the phrase see naples and die not because of any special beauty in the city itself but because of its magnificent setting on the hills sweeping up from the wonderful bay of naples and arched by azure skies twenty miles to the south lies the lovely island of capri where some say the sirens dwelt on the east vesuvius sulks and broods over the scene ready the romans declare to do to wicked naples what it did in the first century after christ to licentious pompeii and herculaneum until seventy nine a d vesuvius was regarded as an ordinary peak but on the twenty fourth of august in that year there came first an earthquake and then a dark cloud spreading like a black fleece over the summit finally with a great roar the top of the mountain was blown off and masses of lava mud stones and ashes were hurled out in a few days pompeii was covered with twenty feet of ashes beneath which it is estimated there lay buried two thousand of her population now the patient work of years has uncovered about half of the ancient city and we can see how like our own were the nature and the activities of the men and women of centuries ago up to the last decade the method of excavation was simply digging a ditch deepening it until a floor was reached and widening the pit sideways to the walls but since the italian government approved the ideas of the archaeologist spinazzola the digging has been done in horizontal layers and with extreme care as objects are found they are photographed and their positions are noted so that when a house is restored its contents may be put back in place moreover instead of seeing their finds carted off to the national museum of naples the excavators are allowed to keep them at pompeii some years ago it was thought that the homes of pompeii were of only one story and had no windows along the streets but spinazzola's methods have shown two-story buildings with overhanging balconies and front windows aplenty one of the newly excavated houses has been reconstructed even to the ceilings of the upper floors in the dining room a meal has been uncovered just as it was set on the table when the owner fled a space in the floor shows that the food was sent up on a dumb waiter frescoes adorn the walls of all the houses unearthed and the baths are amazingly luxurious two of the finest frescoes discovered in pompeii adorn the doorway of a dyer's shop on one side the god mercury is shown stepping out of a yellow marble temple his robes blown back by his hurry on the other side is venus in a royal chariot drawn by four huge elephants about her shoulders is a cloak of glorious blue while on her head is a golden crown the sign on another shop tells the provincial townsman that the owner is a citizen of the imperial city the fresco shows romulus on one side of the door and on the other aeneas who picked out the side of rome escaping from burning troy with his aged father on his back and his little son by his side evidently pompeii was in the midst of an election when the catastrophe occurred for the walls are covered with the claims of rival candidates we beg you to elect g gavium rufum a law-making duumvir says one others show that while women did not have the vote they evidently had political influence zmyrina recommends c julius polybius for the post of law-making is written on one wall 
g gavium rufum must have hated that sign simrina and asselina both commend c lalium for the post of dumver charged with maintenance of roads and sacred and public buildings maybe it was lalium who wrote the inscription scribbled on another wall farewell asselina try to love me c cuspius who aspired to the post adile apparently felt the need of no lady friend's help he toots his horn in front of his own house by declaring that if glory must be given to those who live honestly then to this young man must well-earned glory be given on the walls of the houses at crossroads were fixed big bells which passing chariot drivers struck with their whips so as to warn those approaching from another direction the crossroads were sacred places for here sacrifices were offered the patron gods of the city an altar unearthed at one such place bore the ashes of the last sacrifice to the pagan deities before the eruption of vesuvius overwhelmed the city they were powerless to save end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. In Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. The name sounds like Ultima Thule, and it seems to indicate the jumping off place of creation. Czecho might be a pet name for a monkey, and to many the word Slovak is synonymous with Dago. In the minds of millions of Americans, the country has no identity and I doubt if one man out of ten on the street can place it. Still, it contains five times as many people as Denmark, seven times as many as Norway, and ten or more times the number in Turkey. It is in the busiest and best part of Europe, and though still so young, has already taken its place in the finance, the business, and the politics of this side of the world. Most of the other republics that resulted from the Treaty of Versailles are largely farming propositions, Czechoslovakia is an industrial entity with factories ready to turn out goods, not only for the nation, but for the other peoples of Europe, for South America, and even for us. I came across the Atlantic with a representative of the biggest of the Chicago mail-order houses. He was on his way to Europe to buy stocks for his firm, and one of the most important countries on his list was this. Czechoslovakia will sell him glassware and notions, laces and embroideries, linens and other textiles, necklaces, brooches, and many of the novelties that our women will skimp their house money to buy. Czechoslovakia is long and narrow and lies like a fat sausage in the great sandwich of Central Europe. It is between Germany and Poland on the north and Austria, Hungary, and Romania on the south. One end is in the Carpathian Mountains on the edge of Romania, and the other is about 600 miles away, right in the heart of industrial Germany. Turn it on the map of Europe, and it would reach from Milan to London. Drop it down on the United States, and it would extend from New York to Detroit. From north to south, its boundaries at the widest are not as far apart as New York and Baltimore, and in some places the country is not wider than the distance between Baltimore and Washington. Yet Czechoslovakia has an area almost seven times that of Massachusetts. This stretch of land is composed of three provinces, or states. At the west is Bohemia, a rich plain almost surrounded by mountains. It is peppered with factories, and practically every inch of it is intensively cultivated. It is half the size of Ohio, and has a population equal to that of greater New York. In the east is Slovakia, nearly as large. Much of it lies in the high Carpathians, which have scenery as beautiful as that of Switzerland or the Austrian Tyrol. A land of farms, it is also exceedingly rich in natural resources. Its people number more than three times those of Detroit. Between these two states lies Moravia, which partakes somewhat of the character of each of the others. It is as big as Massachusetts, and its population approximates that of Chicago. From the standpoint of future development, Czechoslovakia as a whole is one of the best lands of Europe. It has a fertile soil, and its farmers are proportionately greater in number than those of any other European country except France or Russia. 
four fifths of the mines of the old empire of austria hungary are within its borders it has soft and hard coal producing more than thirty million tons in a year while it mines annually two million tons of iron ore and has oil wells yield ten thousand tons of petroleum it has gold silver copper tin opals and garnets in bohemia is a radium mine which until the recent discoveries in the belgian congo was one of the richest in the world its annual output is two grams an amount which i believe may be somewhere near the size of a small pea the land is one of the best wooded of europe of every three acres one is covered with trees and the annual timber cut amounts to more than enough to make a boardwalk an inch thick and five feet wide from prague to the moon the country has nearly fourteen million inhabitants or about twice as many as holland or belgium and one-third as many as italy or france it has more than double the number of people left in austria the czechs the moravians and the slovaks make up the bulk of the population they belong to the same race as the russians besides the ten million slavs there are something like three million germans many of the german-speaking people are however of slavic origin and are classed as germans only because of their language and their associations with germany in the past in time it is believed that all will be firmly welded together into one nation four out of every ten of the people of czechoslovakia live on farms or in small villages but there are several large cities and many small industrial centers prague where i am writing compares in population with baltimore st louis or boston it is the capital and chief business center brun the industrial capital of moravia is about the size of birmingham or atlanta and bratislava on the danube the biggest town in slovakia has nearly one hundred thousand people pilsen bohemia where there is a big steel mill and where some of the best beer of europe is made is about the same size czechoslovakia is a land of rivers the danube forms part of its southern boundary giving access to the black sea and the mediterranean prague is situated on the moldau which flows into the elbe and thence out to the ocean so that the city has water communications all the way to the north sea the elbe also cuts through bohemia and it is now proposed to make a canal from it to the danube and one from the odor to the danube as well the elbe danube canal has already been started and will probably be completed within a decade by a series of locks it will cross the divide between the north and black seas on the bohemian moravian frontier at an altitude of one thousand feet the czechs have an outlet to the sea at hamburg where they were given the use of certain wharves by the versailles treaty they have also wharf rights at stetton on the baltic at the mouth of the odor and wharves at trieste at the head of the adriatic so that although their republic is in the interior they have access to three of the important seaports of europe every part of the republic can be reached by railway the stations are of stone and the one in prague named after president wilson would be a credit to any american city train accommodations are as comfortable as in any part of europe i traveled first class and with my secretary had a compartment at less than half the cost of the same thing in switzerland we paid seven or eight cents a mile the second class fares are about three or four cents and the third about two cents although there was no dining car there were plenty of chances to eat at the station buffets on the train journey to prague i had a good chance to see something of the industries of bohemia we rode four or five hours through a beehive of workshops every town had its factories of one kind or another and the country was a crazy quilt of rich farms the bohemian basin is well watered and its farms are better than those of any area of the same size in the united states the farm buildings are substantial and larger and more costly than ours i saw hundreds of huge barns of stone or brick covered with stucco and roofed with red tiles the houses of the owners are commodious and the farmstead often consists of a dozen or so large buildings some of which are given up to the laborers all were well painted and in excellent repair 
At one station we stopped several hours, and I took a car and rode through the country. Every one I met seemed happy and enthusiastic, and all spoke proudly of the Republic. The people are still rejoicing in their freedom from Germany and Austria. The methods of cultivation are old-fashioned, and women and cattle furnish a large part of the labor. The oxen draw the plows and carts, while the women hoe and weed and help in the harvesting. I saw several swinging scythes. They also draw carts, and some of them carry great cornucopia baskets, slung to their backs and so heavily loaded as to bend them double. The men and the women work in gangs in the fields. Often I saw one man bossing a gang of twenty women. I photographed some girls digging potatoes. They were clad in blue cotton with handkerchiefs wrapped round their heads, and some of them were good-looking. They laughed as I snapped the camera. The oxen were fine, burly animals, which pulled by their heads instead of their shoulders, as with us. A strap is fastened across the forehead, just under the horns, and hitched to tugs on the plow. They draw loads in the same way in this region, but I am told yokes are used farther east. I like Prague. Although the white hair of the Middle Ages still hangs on its shoulders, it is full of enterprise and business. Its peoples seem prosperous and the stores are large and full of fine goods. The city has now in the neighborhood of 700,000 population and is creeping out into the country. There is a necklace of smokestacks about the old town and many new factories are going up in the suburbs. The streets are wide and paved with Belgian blocks. The sidewalks in the chief business section are of black and white mosaic set in patterns, the stones being about an inch square. In front of my hotel, there is a mosaic pavement at least 20 feet wide, laid in the form of a checkerboard of black and white blocks. The arcades here remind me of those in Bern. They are 20 or 30 feet wide and walled with stores often 50 feet or more in height. There seem to be plenty of banks, and not a few of them have Czech American clerks. I cashed my letter of credit today at a bank where the manager was from Pittsburgh. He tells me he can make more money here than in America, and that this is the belief of many of the Czechs who have returned from our country. The manager says he is introducing American methods and quick service, instead of making the depositor sit down and wait upon the leisure of the clerks like so many barbershop customers. I have been motoring today from one government building to another. It took us generations to build our capital and put up our other great government structures. Czechoslovakia had only to reach out her hands and take what she wanted, for the Austrians left her all of the buildings she needed. The mighty castle erected by the kings of Bohemia on the great bluff overhanging the Moldau River is now a home for the president and also contains offices for the various departments. This castle is known as the Hradschen. It covers several hundred acres and is a veritable labyrinth of immense buildings surrounding courts with tunnel-like passages from one structure to another. It is antiquated and badly arranged for offices, but it accommodates thousands of clerks and most of the government activities. In the center of this maze is the famous Cathedral of St. Vitus, which was begun in 1344, almost 600 years ago, and a small portion of which is still uncompleted. The church is dedicated to St. Vitus, who is said to have come here from Rome about 300 years after Christ to bring the people salvation. St. Vitus was not only an evangelist, but a physician besides. He had also that faith which can move mountains and charity as well. He performed many miracles, including the cure of nervous diseases. It is said that when the Emperor Diocletian called him in to cast a devil out of one of the princes, St. Vitus restored the patient in mind and body. Then the Emperor urged the saint to give up Christianity, but he refused. Upon being thrust into prison, he was seen night after night dancing with the angels to celestial music and from that time on he became the patron of dancers, as well as of all those with nervous affections. Later, Diocletian sentenced St. Vitus to be put into a kettle of boiling lead, but he came out with no more hurt than was sustained by Shadrach, 
Meshach, and Abednego, when they were bound in their hose, their tunics, and their mantles, and thrown into the fiery furnace by Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible says not a hair of these three saints was singed, and the fire had no effect upon their bodies. It was the same with St. Vitus. The molten lead harmed not a bit of his flesh, nor a thread of his garments. After that the saint came to Bohemia and did the work commemorated by the Prague Cathedral. He finally returned to Rome, where, because of his religion, he was, like Daniel, cast into a den of lions, but the animals licked his feet. Just one more story of the cathedral. It relates to Sophia, the pious and beautiful daughter of an early king of Bohemia, whose hand was asked in marriage by a Bavarian monarch. Sophia rejected him because he was a pagan and scoffed at Christianity. Her royal father, however, insisted for political reasons on the marriage, whereupon she prayed to the Virgin to destroy her beauty so that she might not attract the passions of wicked men. When she awoke the next morning, she was cross-eyed and snub-nosed, and her face was covered with whiskers, and such luxuriant whiskers. In the painting of the lady, to be seen in one of the chapels of the cathedral, they are shown falling halfway to her waist, and they reminded me of the ancient limerick. There was an old man with a beard, who said, It is just as I feared. Two owls and a hen, four larks and a wren, have all built their nests in my beard. The pagan lover took one look and abandoned his suit. Thereafter, Sophia was plagued no more by proposals. Prague is full of stories like this. It has labyrinthine monasteries dating back to the Middle Ages and spires and domes that have pierced the heavens for 700 years. The best view of the city is from the top of a tower in the grounds of the great Schoenborn Palace, which serves as the American legation. It is right under the Rotschen, and in its seven rolling acres of beautiful gardens is a stone tower overlooking the Moldau and the surrounding country. It was built, I doubt not, before the United States existed. I climbed the hill and the stone stairs to the top of the tower. At my back was the enormous castle, as well as the palaces that have been bought by the British, French, and Japanese for their diplomatic headquarters, while in front, across the winding Moldau, lay the quaint, many-towered, red-roofed city of Prague. Below was the Charles Bridge, one of seven spanning the river. The bridge is decorated with 28 stone and bronze images of saints, including one of St. John of Nepomuk, who vanquished devils and converted 8,000 Saracens and 2,500 Jews to the Christian faith. He is the patron saint of Bohemia. Nearby is a marble slab marking the spot where he was thrown from the bridge into the water. As the body floated away, five miraculous stars appeared and hovered over it until it was brought to the shore. Good Catholics, as they pass over the bridge, put their hands on the slab and then kiss their fingers. End of chapter 10「Eleven of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Motoring through Bohemia. Take a seat with me in one of the automobiles of the State Department of Czechoslovakia for a ride across the fertile plains of Bohemia. It is a big seven-passenger touring car made in Prague, and although it has only four cylinders, it can easily make fifty miles an hour. Our Czech chauffeur wants to show that his Praga is the equal of any automobile made in America, and like Yehu, the son of Nimshi, he driveth furiously. We leave the Palace Hotel in the heart of the city, fly down a wide avenue, turn into the busy Graben, the street laid where once was the moat surrounding medieval Prague, and go past the huge powder tower. We cross Market Square with its bronze statue of John Hus and drive over the river Moldau on one of its seven stone bridges. We pass oil mills, locomotive works, electric lamp factories, and other industrial plants, and soon find ourselves in the country. The straight road is macadamized as smooth as a floor and lined with fruit trees. 
on both sides and reaching away to the horizon are the vast plains where men and women are harvesting the fat crops the fields have no fences there are no haystacks or barns or other buildings on the landscape the people live in villages of one and a half story houses and we run through a town at every few miles but see jan is slowing the automobile we are at the edge of a village and there is a great sign by the roadside warning us that we must slow down to six kilometers or about four miles an hour we are surrounded by geese there are flocks of them everywhere each herded by a bare-legged girl who looks angrily after the car as we send them flying this way and that the geese themselves are quite as independent as the citizens of this new republic and they hiss in shrill protest as we crowd them to the side of the road geese are a characteristic feature of every bit of our journey they are raised by the thousands in bohemia and every farm and every house has its flock they are so big that the portions of goose served in the restaurants look like chops and steaks we make notes of the village as we go through it is different from any town of the same size in america the houses are of one and a half stories and their front walls are flush with the street they are of yellow stucco with red tiled overhanging roofs the doors and the windows are small and are painted pale green the windows of the attics are hardly bigger than a sheet of note paper in this town there are no sidewalks and the gutter runs right along in front of the doorsteps other villages i have seen have somewhat better roadways but none has any sidewalks to speak of the gardens and the stables are back of the houses with manure piles often lying between the only flowers we see are those in the window boxes the water supply is chiefly from wells or from the streams where women are kneeling and washing their clothes in large towns such as podebrity for instance the water comes from a fountain in the public square and the servant maids come and dip it out with basins into huge wooden buckets which they take through the streets on their backs i photographed a bobbed-haired blue-eyed girl carrying five gallons or more at a load in the center of the village is the church it has a great tower with a cross on the top and there is a clock set into the walls i venture bohemia has more town clocks than any other land in central europe almost every steeple has its cross and nearly every house has its shrine there are also crosses out in the country where the people kneel and pray by the side of the road the bohemians have always been deeply religious and until the end of the world war roman catholicism was the faith of the country since then a wave of protestantism and agnosticism has swept over the land a new national church having features of both the catholic and the greek orthodox sects has many adherents now we are again in the country we pass heavy teams of draft horses hauling loads of two or three tons the horses wear high collars trimmed with brass and ending in a leather horn that rises high over the withers the wagons are like those of russia and much like the boats in which we haul wood at home they are high up on wheels and both single and double teams work with a tongue when one horse is used he is hitched to one side of the tongue and the single tree at the back holds the two tugs there are many ox carts and wagons drawn by white-faced cattle and now and then a huge motor truck comes plugging along i saw one ox cart dragging an airplane on wheels the lighter traffic is carried by human beings usually by those of the weaker sex there are women pushing wheelbarrows of bricks hay and grain and women going along with great baskets of fruit or grass on their backs i have yet to see in czechoslovakia a job that is too heavy for the women there seem to me to be four of them for every man in the fields the women do as much as or more than the men but their wages of three cents an hour are less than those paid to men there is a nominal eight-hour law for farm labor but this is arranged so that it means so many thousand hours a year and the farmers and their helpers can divide it into such periods as they please the result is that the regular farm hand is bound to put in more than eight hours in good weather so as to make up for the days of cold and rain these farm women seem healthy and happy the young ones are pretty and with their red kerchiefs their bright colored waists their short skirts and bare legs 
they attract the eye they are as straight as the ray candles they use in the hay fields and graceful withal the older women are weather-worn but their exercise keeps down their flesh in fact as an anti-fat treatment for our idle candy-eating american women i suggest the farm every square foot of land here is under cultivation and the crops are larger on the average than ours the wheat yield for instance is about twenty seven bushels per acre and the oats yield thirty six the potato crop averages ninety bushels on each of the million and a half acres planted to tubers the corn yield is smaller than ours but in sugar beets the czech farmers surpass us raising more than nine thousand million pounds per annum or an average of nine tons per acre in riding over the country i see no weeds or any fences dividing the fields the land is farmed scientifically every bit of manure is saved each of the farms i have visited small and large has a cistern under the stable and the horses the cattle and the hogs stand on concrete floors draining into the cisterns from which the liquid and washings are afterward pumped into tank wagons and spread over the fields the farmsteads are interesting take for instance one at opolani a village of about seven hundred people where i visited the home of my chauffeur's brother this holding of one hundred and fifty acres lay on the outskirts of the village and was cut through by a brook work was going on in the fields and the farmer had helping him a half dozen women who put in twelve hours every day my guide said that the property had been in the same family for more generations than he could number there were two houses of white stucco one occupied by my chauffeur's mother and the other by his brother and his family adjoining each home and practically under the same roof with it were stables filled with cattle pigs horses and goats each was floored with concrete and fitted with all arrangements for economical feeding between the two houses was a large barnyard containing a storehouse for grain both houses were clean and the barnyards looked like tennis courts we took coffee with jan's brother in a sort of kitchen and bedroom combined there was a porcelain stove in the corner above which i saw this sign in check believe in the lord jesus christ and the house is saved the coffee was good and the cherry shortcake seeds and all tasted delicious during my stay i took pictures of some of the farm girls among them a sister and a cousin of the owner who came from the village stream in which they had been waiting while they washed the clothes both were good-looking i can assure you the next farm at which i stopped belonged to the president of the agrarian bank in prague this farm situated about thirty miles from the capital contains three or four hundred acres although it was a beautiful concrete structure of two stories and in all respects a most comfortable home the house faced the barnyard within a few feet of the home were two one-story barns or stables each two hundred feet long all the buildings were roofed with tiles and all were of brick covered with stucco i went through the stables with the owner and looked at the livestock all of which is kept stabled for here the grass is cut chopped fine and fed in the stalls this farm was especially interesting because it had been bought by the banker as a result of the land reform following the independence of czechoslovakia before the war a great part of the country was owned by several hundred aristocrats heirs to large estates handed down from their ancestors who had taken part in putting down the czech revolution in sixteen twenty it was in that year that the czechs were defeated by the austrians at the battle of the white mountain and the czechish nobility was practically wiped out the common people were made serfs and for a long time the austrians with the hungarians and the germans who came in to help fight the czechs had the best properties while the original owners had practically no land at all some of the german and austrian nobles had enormous estates prince schwarzenberg for instance had about six hundred thousand acres prince Liechtenstein had more than a quarter of a million and others owned tracts almost as large these properties were well administered their owners took the labor of the peasants giving them small huts and plots of ground to work for themselves and paying them infinitesimal wages i have heard that on the estate of a noble relative 
of a Hungarian minister at Washington, the average peasant received only 30 kronen, or $6 a year. When the new republic was formed, Parliament passed a law authorizing the government to buy these great estates and distribute them more equitably among the people. Some millions of acres will thus ultimately come into the hands of small farmers. On this trip through the country, I visited some of the cooperative institutions to be found all over Bohemia. Some of these are made up of the farmers, some of laboring men, and some of consumers. They are closely allied to the political parties, each association having a party as its special defender. The consumers' cooperative societies have a membership of 127,000 and are doing a business of more than 1,000 million kronen. Czechoslovakia has more than 10,000 cooperative undertakings with above 2 million members. With their families, these people embrace more than half the population. The Czech societies now propose to combine with the cooperative societies of the Balkan states, and the result may be a buying and selling organization of great strength. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. A Nation of Athletes. Suppose the United States should have a great gymnastic awakening. Suppose the care of the body should be the slogan not only of the men but of the women as well. Suppose there should spring up overnight in every city and village and even out in the country clubs of from 50 to 500 each member of which should engage in athletic training three nights a week all through the year. Let the clubs include the grown-ups, and let the training begin with children of six years. Let the instruction be given by the best of physical directors, aided by all the first-class gymnasium appliances, and, at the same time, let it be accompanied by the inculcation of ideals of clean living, high thinking, and patriotism, so that the soul grows with the body. What an effect all this would have upon the rank and file of our nation. Well, this is just what is going on and has been going on for a generation or so in Bohemia and Moravia. It is built up a people which now that it has regained its independence is bound to be one of the strongest factors in the Europe of the future. The institution that is doing this is known as the so-called. You have probably heard of the meets in the great stadium at Prague every summer, where 12,000 women and 15,000 men, delegates from the many athletic societies of Czechoslovakia, go through their gymnastics like one vast machine to music composed for the occasion. You may have seen movies of the great army of girls dressed in short dark skirts and white waists, tossing their 24,000 bare arms to the sky, bending their backs toward the earth swaying this way and that in rhythmic motion, or marching with their 24,000 black-stockinged legs rising and falling as one in time with the strains of the band. You may have seen the 15,000 men bare to the waist going through their myriad evolutions. All this is wonderful as one of the great sport shows of the world, but after all it is only an exhibition. What I want you to see is the so-call as it works every day throughout the Republic. The so-calls are no new things in Czechoslovakia. They date back to the time of our civil war, when the awakened spirit of national independence was strong among the Bohemians, then suffering from the oppressions of the Austrian Habsburg rulers. Within a few years after the formation of the First Society in 1862, their number had increased until they were having a widespread influence. In 1866, when war broke out between Austria and Prussia, Dr. Tyers, the leading spirit of the associations, planned a military organization, made rules for discipline and drill, and formed a corps of volunteers for home defense. The name so-called means falcon and stands for the bravery and love of freedom of the eagle. In the Yugoslavic songs of chivalry, the word is applied to brave heroes. Throughout the years, the so-calls helped keep alive the Czechs' desire for nationality, 
and trained their bodies to fight for freedom when the time should be ripe there are so calls in every city town village and district of the state of bohemia they are to be found in every ward of the cities and there are twenty-six in prague in the smaller societies the men go through their exercises on three days of the week and the other three days the gymnasiums are left for the women in some of the larger halls there are sufficient accommodations to permit the men and the women to exercise in different rooms at the same time the section we shall visit has three hundred and sixty girl members of all ages from six to thirty-six or more they are divided into classes those under fourteen drilling from six to seven o'clock in the evening those between fourteen and eighteen from seven to eight and the older ones from eight until nine the whole big building is devoted to gymnasiums room after room is fitted up with horizontal and parallel bars flying rings leather horses dumbbells indian clubs and other gymnastic apparatus we chose the hour between seven and eight o'clock and go to the hall without notice entering the lobby we are introduced to a leader of one of the sections a girl of eighteen who has been a member of the so-called since she was six she is a beauty and as straight as one of the poles used for vaulting the crossbar in the gymnasium though as plump as a partridge she moves as gracefully as did atalanta in her race for the apple of gold her face is fair her hair is blonde and her eyes are as blue as the bohemian sky her bare arms and neck show no rolls of fat she seems to be made of steel springs from head to heel she wears black bloomers and stockings with a short sleeved blouse of white embroidered in red at the throat along the shoulders and down the front after she has shown us through the building we take a seat with her in the gallery where we look down on more than one hundred girls the young amazons swing indian clubs and take setting up exercises they flash from the floor to the ceiling grasping the flying rings in their hands they run up the springboard and vault over tables four feet in width theirs is no dilettante play either it is hard work from start to finish and fat girls and lean girls tall girls and short girls must all do the same the exercises change every ten minutes so that during that hour every muscle is brought into play it is an interesting sight most of the girls are dressed like our guide but not a few are without their stockings and their rosy bare legs show from ankle to knee after the close of this session i saw one hundred of these same girls practice a drill with indian clubs tipped with incandescent electric lights the room was in darkness except for the tiny colored lights that twinkled as the girls swung their clubs in time to the music the effect was wonderfully charming the girls were practicing for a national exhibition a few months off as i looked on i thought of the similar drills going on at this same hour all over the republic and i could not help but think of the effect on the nation the girls of this so-called came from every class of society some are department store clerks some stenographers and typists and some have their own cars and belong to the idle rich but the atmosphere is one of perfect democracy and the best of good feeling seems to prevail and just here i want to say a word about the women of czechoslovakia as i have observed them on this flying trip through the country they are beautiful and womanly and withal free from some of the weaknesses of the girls of our american cities there is practically no use of the lipstick the powder puff or the rouge pot prague is almost as big as boston and almost half again as large as washington nevertheless in one afternoon stroll you will see more powder and paint on washington street that ancient cowpath of boston or on f street in our national capital than you could collect if you scraped the faces of the prague girls from one year's end to the other according to the new constitution of czechoslovakia both women and men have the right to vote and to sit in the parliament there are eleven women members in the house and two in the senate but i am told that the small representation in the latter body is due to the fact that to be elected to the senate one must be forty-five years old and but few of the women wish to acknowledge that they have reached that age as to voting here there is no need of a literacy test 
as far as bohemia and moravia are concerned every one can read and write and the standard of education is above that of almost any other country of the world czechoslovakia has about two million pupils in the schools it has more than fifteen thousand schools primary secondary high schools and universities schools for women and schools for men there are twenty three thousand students in the two universities at prague alone and there are universities at brno and elsewhere slovakia is much more backward than the rest of the country but since the organization of the government three thousand new schools have been established there including many for adults and everything is being done to bring its educational standing up to that of the rest of the republic the boys and girls feel their responsibility as members of the new nation they know they will have an equal chance from now on and may like our american youth hope to be president some day they have before them the example of the great heroes of the revolution dr edward bennis first premier of czechoslovakia left the farm at the age of twelve and worked his way through the university and into international fame before he was thirty-five president masaryk was born poor and as a boy was apprenticed to a blacksmith nevertheless he became one of the great scholars and leaders of central europe and is now revered as the george washington of his country prague is one of the oldest university cities of europe and since the world war it has become the great center of education for the slavs as soon as the new republic was established the young people came in such hordes that they could not be accommodated they slept in the parks at the railway stations and on the tables of the coffee houses the city turned over its gymnasiums and university halls to them using some of the furniture left by the red cross but more and more came until the people of prague were in despair then it was decided that the students should build houses for themselves the city contributed the site and the national government pledged four million kronen to start the work dr masaryk gave a million and a half kronen from the fund presented to him by the nation on his seventieth birthday and his daughter alice masaryk and others helped swell the contributions on the day set to begin building the colony eight hundred men and women students reported for work and more than fifteen hundred finally took a hand the girls established a kitchen to feed the boys and within a short time there was a big gang of university men doing things they once would have thought beneath their dignity they dug the foundations and did all the rough labor of carting and carrying every man who worked four hours got his meals free and when the dormitories were open no one was given a room in the colony unless he had worked three hundred hours or would agree to devote that much time to the development of the institution it was such a novelty to see the intellectuals doing manual labor that thousands came to watch them at work the students made the spectators pay fees and sold stones and bricks as souvenirs realizing fifty thousand kron in the first day all this work was directed by skilled overseers and mechanics and the result is a group of houses that is now accommodating about seven hundred students since my visit to the colony i have gone through the students home an institution established by our y m c a and the ohio state university the home is a sort of clubhouse and cafeteria where meals are furnished to students practically at cost it is patronized by something like six thousand boys and girls and it is now serving several thousand lunches and about fifteen hundred dinners every day the lunch costs about eleven cents and the dinner costs a cent or so less the meals are almost the same each consisting of meat bread vegetables and coffee but the luncheons are the more popular for most of the students can afford but one full meal a day in addition to the coffee and rolls they have for breakfast and supper this is not hardship for most of them since they would not fare better at home the students who frequent this institution belong to twenty-three different nationalities there are of course czechs moravians and slovaks but there are also ukrainians ruthenians yugoslavs bulgarians russians and a great many jews the home has an auditorium for lectures and a social hall it has reading rooms where the boys come to study for many of them cannot afford light or heat in their own quarters the club is governed by a council one delegate being elected for each two hundred students 
in such a way that every nationality and faction is represented as a rule the different nationalities get along well together up to the present the only quarrel that has occurred was one between the magyars and slovaks the magyars had sung in public a song that the slovaks declared immoral the students court settled the question in favor of the magyars who showed that the slovaks had not rightly interpreted the ditty both women and men use the home and come together in the social hall the head of the woman student body is a tall fine-looking czech a young graduate of vassar i asked her how she liked that college she replied i just love vassar and the best i could wish for any czech girl is that she might go there to study end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. From Prague to Vienna. I have come from the capital of Czechoslovakia to the capital of the Austrian Republic, from one of the newly christened national capitals of Europe to one that was gray-haired and wrinkled when our own city of Washington was laid out along the Potomac. The first was a city when William the Conqueror landed in England, and the second was a center of trade when the Crusaders floated down the Danube on their way to rescue Jerusalem. It was only 180 years after Christ that my old friend, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, died in the Roman fortress on the site of Vienna, leaving the meditations we all love to read. And here Charlemagne built a stronghold after he had driven out the Asiatic tribes that had set up an empire on the Danube. It was in the 8th century that he established the Margravate of Austria, which later on succumbed to the Hungarians. During the Crusades, Vienna began to build up its trade with the East, and from that time to this, it has been the chief mart of the Danube, that great water highway between Europe and Asia. On my way to Vienna, I came through some of the lands that Austria lost by the Treaty of St. Germain, which the Allied powers drew up for her signature. I crossed Bohemia, Moravia, and Slovakia via the Danube. The city is so much the child of that mighty river that I did not want to reach it by railway, so I took a train at Prague and rode for the better part of a day to Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia. There I boarded an Austrian steamer and came upstream, fighting the current to where I am now. Along the way, I was surprised at the natural wealth I saw in Moravia. The province is bigger than Massachusetts and has as many people as Baltimore and Philadelphia combined. Much of it is beautifully rolling and the hills are covered with forests. We passed numerous sawmills and at the stations found lumber stacked up for shipment. There were mountains of pulp wood ready for the market and truckloads of telegraph and telephone poles going out of the country. The forests seemed to be well cared for, and I saw no underbrush anywhere. Farther south, the soil was richer. On both sides of the railroad fields of wheat, oats, and grass waved to and fro under the wind, and I could see nothing but crops reaching on to the horizon. The scenes reminded me of the words of the psalmist. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. Here, all the trees that line every road, ditch, and creek are fruit-bearing. The Moravian villages looked prosperous, and the farmers must be rich. Most of the houses were roofed with slate, and their stuccoed walls had been recently whitewashed. There were industrial centers and towns at every few miles. I spent some time at Brno, the capital, which has more than 200,000 inhabitants, and is a manufacturing town in the heart of a farming region. It is noted for its textiles and used to be called the Manchester of Austria. Brno was once known as Brun, and its rechristening indicates the new status of things in this part of Europe. As soon as the Czechs won their nationality, they proceeded to sow place names in their own language over the new nation. Pilsen, still famous for its beer, has become Pilsen. Pressburg is now Bratislava, after one of the early rulers of Bohemia, Marienbad one can scarcely recognize as Mariansky Lazny, while it would seem that Carlsbad would never be so popular as a health resort 
with such a tongue-twisting designation as Karlovy Vary. In Slovakia, one does not notice so much enthusiasm for the Czechs as in Moravia and Bohemia. The Slovaks are another branch of the Slavic people, not nearly so progressive as the Czechs, whom they call the Prussians of the Slavs. The people of Prague, on the other hand, seem to regard their more backward countrymen much as the New Yorker does the citizens of Arizona and New Mexico. To them, Slovakia is a kind of wild and woolly East. The Slovaks explain their high percentage of illiteracy by saying that rather than learn to read and write the Magyar tongue, which the Hungarians tried to force upon them, they went without learning at all. The Slovaks and the Czechs use a closely allied speech so that it is easy for them to understand each other. Slovakia is a mountainous and thinly populated region with fertile valleys separated by ridges sloping toward the Danube. I found it a land of small farms, forests, and villages, rather than one of cities, mills, and shops. I noticed that the women worked hard and saw a number of them bent double under great loads of long poles, which were strapped to their backs. I was struck with the honest faces of the people. Indeed, I have been told that the Slovak's peasant's honesty is proverbial, and that his home bank will lend him money even to go to America to seek his fortune. The money lenders know that either he or his family will surely pay the debt. I spent the night in Bratislava at a good hotel, where my room cost me a dollar and a quarter, and before taking my steamer next morning, I drove through the cobblestone streets in a one-horse carriage. Bratislava was once the capital of Hungary, and it was here that the Habsburgs were crowned kings. On the tower of the old coronation church, which dates back to the 13th century, there is still a gilded Hungarian royal crown. The town was known as Pressburg to the Austrians and Pazoni to the Hungarians. Its population numbers 100,000, mostly Slovaks and Hungarians. The steamer that brought us from Bratislava up to Vienna was one of four boats plying between Rusak, Bulgaria, past Belgrade to the Austrian capital. The steamship company was originally known as the Monarch Line, and when they were planned, the four boats were to be named after great rulers of the time, Kaiser Wilhelm, Francis Joseph, Ferdinand of Bulgaria, and Mohammed V, Sultan of Turkey. The two boats built during the World War were named respectively Franz Joseph and Wilhelm, but after the Treaty of Peace, it was decided to throw down the monarchs and put up the planets as stars that could not be affected by the wars of the future. Wilhelm and Franz Joseph became Jupiter and Saturn, and the two boats that were added later were christened Neptune and Helios. I came up on Helios, which was about the only sun we had for much of the way. It rained now and then, but just as we crossed the boundary of Austria and Czechoslovakia, a mighty rainbow appeared spanning the river that separates the two countries. One end of the bow rested in Czechoslovakia and the other in Austria, and the glorious arch of splendid hues seemed like the bow in the clouds God sent up for Noah, the token of a covenant that no more should the deluge of war descend upon the nations so bound together. And yet I fear that the peace of the present is one of armed truce rather than of brotherly love, for as I went on toward Vienna, I frequently saw evidence of hatred on the part of the Czechs and the Slovaks for their former masters. On my way to the boat in Bratislava, I passed a great pedestal without a statue, and was told that there formerly stood the fine bronze figure of the old Habsburg Empress Maria Theresa. Some twenty-odd miles west of Bratislava, the March River flows into the Danube beneath the shadow of a towering rock. This is one of the great divides of human history. Southeast are the plains of Hungary. Southwest, across the Danube, is Austria. Northwest stretch the forests and hills of Bohemia. Northeast lie the little valleys of Slovakia. All four of the racial streams represented in these different regions, Czechs, Germans, Slovaks, and Magyars, were formerly subjects of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In 1896, the Hungarians raised on the rock a beautiful shaft to commemorate the thousand years that the Magyars had held here an outpost of Western civilization. 
now the column lies in ruins shattered doubtless by some slovak with hatred of his ancient masters in his heart such acts of vandalism keep antagonisms alive and breed more bitterness in the vanquished end of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Vienna. Join me this morning as I step out of the old palace that has been changed into the hotel where I am staying and go with me on a trip about Vienna. Let us begin our tour at St. Stephen's Place, which for centuries has been the heart of this old city. There were houses upon this plaza in the days of the Romans. The beautiful south tower which sends its slender gothic spire soaring four hundred and fifty feet up into the sky was completed not long after joan of arc was burned at the stake but what is that crowd on the corner of the square they are gazing at the cathedral spire a gigantic stone finger pointing toward heaven we take our glass and look up some daring man is trying to climb the great structure he seems little bigger than a fly away up there in the blue there are steps inside the tower by which we may reach its pinnacle we enter and walk around and round through the darkness and the climb grows harder as we ascend the five hundred and thirty-three steps to the top on the way we pass a great bell that weighs twenty tons its story goes back to sixteen eighty three when the turks were laying siege to the city and seemed likely to take the stronghold of christendom from this very tower the anxious watchers looked on at the battle outside the old walls until at last they saw the tide turned against the moslems by the arrival of the troops of john sobieski afterwards king of poland from the cannon captured from the turks was made this huge bell which was christened josephine in honor of joseph the first in whose reign it was cast it was rung for the first time on the occasion of the coronation of charles the sixth the father of maria theresa the last time its penetrating tones reverberated over the city was when it was told in eighteen ninety eight at the death of elizabeth the murdered empress of francis joseph notwithstanding the fact that the top of the tower was restored at the time of our civil war the vibrations of the great bell shake the spire so much that it is now considered unsafe to ring it standing on the top of the tower we look to the four points of the compass. That stream at the right, with its long string of barges, is the mighty Danube, the second river in Europe. Rising in the black forest of Germany, it winds its way past Vienna and Budapest, and on down through Hungary, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Romania to the Black Sea. It is a thousand miles longer than the Rhine, and is navigable all the way from Germany until it flows out into that mighty body of water which washes a large part of south russia and gives access through the bosporus to the mediterranean and thence to the atlantic the danube is one of the great water highways of europe and i may say of the world it is already connected by canal with the rhine and projects are under way that will link it with the elbe and the odor so that freight from the north sea and the baltic will one day join the traffic on its waters now turn around and look to the west with the glass you can see the alps but you cannot distinguish the passes that put vienna on the great trade route from italy along which much of the mediterranean commerce goes northward there are other passes through the carpathians on the north vienna is in the basin where many lines of traffic come together there is a downgrade from the chief industrial centers of europe all the way to vienna and it is downgrade from vienna to the black sea the railways follow the easy grades many of them having been built on the roman roads that converged at this point it is its geographic location that makes vienna a great city as one of the government officials said to me yesterday you cannot move a city like this any more than you can change the stars in their orbits the powers that drew up the treaty of saint germain could do much to weaken austria but they could not lift this city out of its place here on the danube at the crossroads of the north and south its geographical location made the vienna of centuries past and will make it the great meeting place of the bankers 
and traders of the future we hold the strategic economic position of this part of the world and will continue to do so until the lord changes the geography of europe but let us turn our minds and our eyes from visions of the future of vienna and observe the city at our feet from our vantage point we can see a unique feature of its plan in the days of maria theresa and until long after the time when napoleon occupied vienna st stephen's place was the center of a town enclosed by walls and a moat dating back to the thirteenth century at intervals there were bridges and stone gateways through which one got glimpses of the fields and the suburbs outside but the people inside generally had their exercise on the top of the walls themselves these were more than two hundred feet wide and took the place of parks and public gardens for which there was no space in the crowded city finally when the congestion grew too great someone conceived the idea of throwing down the walls tumbling them into the moat and making a circular street where once had been the medieval ramparts this is the ringstrasse one of the great thoroughfares of the world it is two miles long and twenty-seven feet wider than pennsylvania avenue in washington double rows of great trees run throughout its length and there are three roadways for traffic the wide flagged sidewalks are lined with magnificent four and five story buildings suppose we go down from the tower hire a cab and take a trot around the ring to see better what it is like upon and within the circle are many huge buildings every one of which has its history and many of which hold treasures of literature science art and music here is the hofburg long the palace of the Habsburgs, and here the parliament building in which democracy has at last gained the upper hand over the proudest aristocracy of europe among the finest structures are the technical high school and the twin museums of art and natural history the two museums are separated by the maria theresa place in which is an imposing statue of maria theresa sitting enthroned on a granite pedestal she holds the scepter she wielded so competently during the forty years of her reign and the document of the pragmatic sanction whereby her father charles the sixth set aside custom and decreed that his only child although a woman should succeed him on the ring is the great university of vienna which has some eight thousand students it also had more than five and a half centuries of continuous existence and next to the university of prague is the oldest german university not far from the university is the town hall which cost more than seven million dollars and which is except for st stephen's cathedral the most imposing edifice in vienna besides containing the offices of the mayor and the other city officials it houses the historical museum and a famous collection of arms and armor one of the trophies preserved here under glass is the skull of the turkish general kara mustafa who led the attack on vienna in sixteen eighty three near it are his shirt and the silken cord sent him by the sultan upon the news of the moslem defeat when taking the hint the officer had strangled himself with the cord the skin was stripped from his face and sent to constantinople to prove that he was really dead later on when belgrade was taken from the turks his body was found in a mosque and a catholic dignitary sent these relics to the vienna museum on the ring too is the great imperial opera house it seems to me the viennese are more proud of their musical attractions than of anything else the whole city breathes music every night you can hear in almost any important street a concert or opera that would be a star performance in any large city of the united states there are band concerts in the parks and practically all the hotels have excellent music at dinner there are a half dozen opera houses and no end of small theaters where music is the chief feature the two big opera houses here are famous the world over the imperial opera which is partly supported by the government has as its conductor richard strauss and the people's opera is conducted by felix von weingartner who only a few years ago deserted berlin for vienna richard strauss does not come of the famous strauss family headed by johann strauss a native of vienna to whose music all the world waltzes 
it was johann who was known as the dance king and it was he who wrote the blue danube richard strauss is a native of munich but his greatest works were composed in vienna the city was also the home of gluck mozart beethoven and brahms it was here that mozart composed figaro the magic flute don juan and the requiem and here beethoven lived for thirty-five years brahms although born in hamburg said that vienna was an ideal place for the composition of symphonies here today lives franz lihar in the house where the merry widow was written and here modern light music may be said to have originated and to have had its development in the darkest hours of vienna's poverty and starvation after the war concerts were held right along and people went hungry so as to hear Cheritza, slezak lehman and other favorites in grand opera i have seen hundreds of school children with their books and packs on their backs they are fat and healthy and look no different from similar children in an american city the people on the streets are fairly well dressed and the crowds one sees 